Camp Mosaic in Illuma. I'll start with Mosaic. Yeah, this is it, this is it. I wonder if there's any pictures. That, oh, they're doing it online now, yeah. This is in a smiley camp, see? Smiley right here. Um, Which means only people in the community, only people who are a smiley can actually go to the camp close. Like it's a religion actually, that's what it is. And I went there as a participant a few times. My memories are really, really fuzzy of when I was a participant. I remember um on the ride there, we would see uh like Volkswagen Beetles occasionally, and we would do that punch buggy thing. Uh, and by the end of the camp, like both of my arms were completely bruised up and like both the girls who rode with me, both of their arms and legs were completely bruised up. I wasn't like super, I was weak, but I was on the fucking lookout for always keeping watch like a sniper for those uh punch buggy opportunities. I remember the magic juice and stuff. This is all when I was a participant, like the chants and all that. I remember getting into trouble a lot. Um, I remember them making us take really cold showers. That's what I remember very distinctly. The dude had like the shower head and he would like spray it at us when we got out of the pool and he would like drench us in cold water. It was traumatic. So um, my mom told me to sign up to be a guide for Mosaic. I believe if you want to be counselor, you have to be like 16 or older, like that's a minimum age you can be like a guide at up to like 17 to like 15 to 17 or whatever something like that um so it just seemed more fitting that i I've become a guide also because being a guide is typically seen as easier even though it's actually not in the camp you go to the camp it's not you should you rather be a counselor so the guides are like assistants counselors are counselors like they are in every camp but these guides like there's guides for activities um like the sports food guide uh the guide for handling logistics there's like a few of those there's guides that uh, deal with each group that deal with like specific activities breaking boundaries and whatnot that handle all that stuff they, they got a lot of like cleaning and stuff to do like it's it's the majority of the guides have really boring jobs like some of them have to like do like paperwork and stuff like that i kind of lucked out with my position i was the swim guide which is like that's a that's actually the best position to have in like not even counselors S swim guide is the best position to have if you're going to mosaic so some counselors were azra moladina and juju aka janade and uh, janade lived in a different state at the time he moved to atlanta after that but he was like the uh visiting counselor for the camp and and like every camp has that they have like a person who like visits from a different state and during training he wasn't even there actually and it was me azra was the counselor but the other guides that were picked were shaza and eliza oh man shaza i already talked about her a bit because she went to my school but i have stories about her dude i don't think i mentioned this we went to school back in jackson elementary we had third grade together and we sat right in front of each other in third grade for like the first few weeks of class i had rec with her as well i had a share project with her damn that's a story i gotta i gotta tell that story i pissed her off big time on that one i'll tell that i'll tell that next so yeah that was shaza and eliza this is my first time meeting eliza also she had a twin she had a twin sister no she had a sister i'm not sure if she was a twin she looked very very similar but i'm still not sure the way it works is like there's a week of training basically cumulatively and then a week of camp and the week of training is like spread over three weeks so like every saturday and sunday for three weeks two days at a time six days total right Right after those last two days, the actual camp comes immediately after that. Damn, this is a lot of stuff I'm, I'm going to preface. Okay, so there's like a hierarchy of, of roles. So the LPT, which are, I'm going to say LPT because I'm used to that. They're like staff. They're the people at the top. They handle the entire camp. They're typically like 25, 20, around that age, you know? And then below that were the counselors and then the guides and then the participants at the very bottom. And that's how the hierarchy goes. So I was guide, so I was pretty low. I guess I should talk about training first. When I, like the first day when I I went to training i wasn't all that interested in camp to start with okay like my mom just wanted me to do it and i was kind of upset that i was going to take up so much of my time in the summer considering like summer 16 you know it was like i went on a cruise that summer i went to id tech that summer like i had a lot of stuff going on um which i'll talk about next so during training yeah i wasn't all that interested it was more obligatory for me than anything else like i, I was like all of my attention, all of my brain power was focused on like throwing car meets, developing software, watching anime, uh, doing photography, planning out a project car, learning motion graphics, making YouTube videos, like, you know, the standard stuff. What, so if I fuck up, at least I can open both my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> stuff like that. That was the kind of shit that we were doing. Every night when we got back, it was just Skype with the squad and we do dumb shit. We were out here like, oh, I can't show that. Um, but that's what we were doing. We were playing brawl like every night. We were playing something. Every night but look at this we were out here on um leak forms or leak zone i'm not sure depending on when, when leak forms got shut down let me yeah leak forms shut down this was one of the most iconic squad pictures ever honestly which for squad we don't take pictures of each other we take pictures of like things we care more about things like i got homies that i got friend, that i've been friends with since like 2006 and it's 2022 right now that like i don't even know if we have a picture together 
like just the two of us in a picture. But we were out here stealing Hulu accounts like the skids we are. I don't know if I'm even allowed to show this actually. Ah, uh, it's, it's so old. Like these guys had to have changed their passwords by now, right? Right? Ah, fuck it. Here is the classic Summer 16 docs. This was the docs of Summer 16, bro. No, he's not on here. The actual dude, the dude whose actual Hulu account we use is not on there. His, his name on Hulu was Toby. It was like dubrain at something.com at yahoo or gmail.com and the password was toothless one like from how to train a dragon uh if that was your account bro if you're if you are dubrain at, at gmail.com or whatever like shout out to you bro if you're out there if you're watching this shout out to you for giving us hulu for like hulu plus actually for like three years you're a real one for that whether or not you knew we were logged in or not because you knew somebody was logged in you knew people other people were logged in whether or not you knew it was us, that shit came in so clutch, dude. So clutch, watching Law and Order and all that. You wanna see the kind of shit we were doing? This was summer 16. Ah, oh, man, I remember when this happened. I was like kind of upset that it, it dropped off, but I, I brought it back up. This is a very small, like if you look in the grand scheme of things, the, the it looked more like this spike right here was more like, and then it went up and it did whatever. This is what I was working with in um, 2016. That's not even when junior year started yet. I had literally taken like the dream job of everyone else in the whole world. I had shit going on, dude. I had like boss shit. So like needless to say, I wasn't really down to like participate in all of this like mosaic stuff. I wasn't really interested in all that. I was just gonna do the bare minimum. I was gonna have fun, but my fun was gonna be kind of like alone, kind of contained. I didn't need to share my fun with everybody else. The first day of training comes. Icebreakers, meeting people. It was a lot more intimate than this most of the time. Actually, no, not on the first training day. The first training day was pretty crammed actually. Also, I should say I'm really bad with names and I recently learned I'm, I'm bad with faces. At the time, everyone just thought I didn't pay attention and I thought the same thing. Apparently, I have symptoms of a much larger issue looming potentially down the line and it scares me that I can't remember like how I ended up in the situation that I'm in right now or memories that I made with friends like a year ago that I see on my Snapchat memories. Like it all just disappears from my mind. And retaining things implicitly is, it's not like a difficult thing to do, but it's, it's a challenge when I want to do it intentionally. Like I end up taking the most random shit and just burning into my memory. It's not even stuff that I actually need to remember. It's the most arbitrary information actually. But maybe it was the fact that at the time I knew like after camp, I'm never going to see any of them again. It's funny because um, we took a personality test during uh, training and we all shared our findings. And these personality tests are stupid anyways. Like people are not the best judges of themselves, especially when given like not really the best questions. The whole concept of using a quiz to judge personality seems like a waste of effort, but I digress. Maybe there could be a much better quiz. I know there's like um, the whole, you can judge people based on the big five, openness, conscientiousness, extrovertedness, agreeableness, and neuroticism, but that's not what this, these tests are. The Myers-Briggs and all that stuff. That's not what these these do. Like these like mainstream personality tests. I want to talk about this actually like on a different day, but it's literally just for people to feel special. Like they told us to do it. So I did the tests. I did like four of them, I think, four different ones. And they're, they're all like, it's not like any of them have a proper standard for how they do things because like the results you get with this like four letter result is kind of, kind of stupid. It's kind of oversimplifying it. It's like astrology. It's just meant for people to feel special. So I got ENTP on two of the tests and I got INTP on the two other. I was actually pretty solid on my responses because I took them all in the same mindset. I took them all like back to back, but I couldn't really decide if I was introverted or extroverted. Personality tests like these stupid ones at least have the common sense to realize that like the actual definitions of uh, introverted and extroverted don't mean shit in, in relation to how social you are. However, the questions that they use to make their conclusion often involve shit about how social you are. Like I was extroverted at the time and I'm introverted now. And it changes like every like five years or so back then it did. I don't suspect it'll change anymore. If it'll change, it'll change one more time, but I think that's it for me. It just so happened that growing up, there were some moments that led me to force myself to to be alone and enjoy being alone and get used to it. And then there were also moments where I was just pressured heavily into, um, I couldn't go a day without hanging out with friends. And I guess I just adapted. And I, I learned to draw my energy from those places. So everyone, I think everyone's actually like this. I think I'm not, nothing special. I even, I'll, I'll leave a link in the description to, um, I've talked about this before about extrovertedness and introvertedness, if that's even like a legit thing that people consider it is colloquially, which clinically, yeah, it is, but it's not in the way people think it is. But it's just a shame that these tests don't like take that kind of stuff into account. Also, I think these tests in general just like fuck up their whole like, like the judgment versus perception trait. Like that's complete BS. 
to perceive is to judge a situation. But I, I digress. When we took the Persian army test, actually, again, I was, I was not really all that attentive. I was not giving it my all, you know? So when I told them I was extroverted, just to subvert them, they all thought I was introverted. They were like going around taking guesses. Oh, you're this, you're this. But they were right in a sense when they called me introverted. Because their thought was like, introverted means you're, you're shy, uh, you don't plan on getting involved socially in the situation. They were right about that. So the first day of training goes by, um, it starts early, it ends late. This girl, this is an important thing you gotta remember. This is a girl who I could tell stories about, bro. Ariba Lakani. She invites all of the counselors and the guides to a sleepover. Um, and there's like 30 of us. It's pretty big. This is after the first training day. That's a Ruba, right there. That was the movie Hush in the background. But yeah, there was quite a few more people there. By that time that we were upstairs in this area, everybody had already left, but downstairs there were quite a few more people. Actually, even before that, there were way, way, way more people. It was like hell of people in the driveway and stuff like that. So many people showed up. They stayed for like an hour and they left. But this was like the remaining people. We were going to do a sleepover. By the way, it's against the rules to do a sleepover because like they know and we know too that if you do a sleepover, like the LPT knows, you're going to stay up the same way we did and you'll be late showing up the next day, which we were. We were late. Like they were absolutely right. So what happens is it, like it's well known that you're not allowed to do that. Like they tell us the rules are very early on, no sleepovers. So Ariba makes a separate group chat. Like we have a group me group chat, okay? And she makes a separate one. Like the first one is like Camp Mosaic 2016 Camp 1 or Camp A or whatever it is. And then Ariba makes a group chat that's Camp Mosaic 2016 without LPT. That's the name of the group chat, something like that. I wasn't gonna go, I had shit to do. Obviously I was making money out here, you know? But um, Ishan convinced me to go. So I get a ride with him and we show up. You know, there's like s'mores and shit, but it, it gets finished once we got there. Like she had like a little like kickback in the beginning before like the sleepover basically. It like transitioned into that, but there was a lot more people there. It turned into a much more intimate thing. There's a lot more people in there in the beginning. But we were like going around, playing with the football, going, catching Pokemon throughout the neighborhood. During this camp was like the peak of Pokemon Go. When we were upstairs, we told like scary stories and shit. Now some of the older uh, counselors in the camp, like the um, 20 year olds and stuff like that, like they knew me since I was really little. Like they were friends with my older brother. Um, and they basically knew me since like before I was even consciously forming memories. My whole life basically. And a lot of my brother's friends were there. There was um, Ariz, Rehan, Sami, Azam, and Oez, and Ichan, all in one camp. That's kind of crazy when I think about it. I didn't think anything of it back then. I was just like, hey, you know, just these guys. But that's like really coincidental when I really look at it. Like, I still occasionally see all these guys. All my brother's friends, they always like treated me like a, you know, the way you would treat like a little brother of a member of the crew, you know? They would like try to like raise me in their own little way, in very minor ways and stuff. They would like always like back me up. Like if I was ever getting bullied, it wasn't just my brother who would go beat the guy up. It was everyone. So despite me, not really wanting to put any mental energy into participating because I got to save my mental energy for, you know, the shit I got going on, for like the business stuff I got going on. They were like really trying to involve me and stuff, especially Ishan and Sami and them. Like they were really out here, like they were trying. They were telling scary stories about me and like funneling all the attention my way to the point where um, by the end of the night, pretty much everyone knew who I was. Like they did all the work for me. So I was like, you know what? Screw it. Screw having my mind on photography and software and cars for right now, you know? While I'm here, I'm gonna enjoy this. I'm gonna put I'm gonna put my brain power into what I'm doing right now. It was really cool of Ariba to do this, by the way. Ariba was one of the funniest people I knew growing up. She told me she got um class clown uh in her school. She got that as the uh superlative, which is like not surprising to me. Like usually you don't find girls who are this funny. You don't find anyone who's this funny actually. She was like one of the boys, bro. You know what she reminds me of? She reminds me a lot of how Cutie Cinderella acts. If you took Cutie Cinderella and you made her two or three times funnier, that's how Ariba is in my mind. She was as much of a class clown as me and my friends. She was right there with us back when we were all kids. But uh, one day, I don't, I don't know, I don't know if it was a slow transition. It's like very fuzzy memories, but she just like stopped, like stopped cracking jokes. She stopped being chill the way she used to. She stopped talking to all of us. It's like she just like stopped being a kid. Uh, she started taking everything so seriously. She would legit dress like a woman in her thirties. It was so weird. Cause we were like nine years old at the time. We were like eight or nine years old. I was so shocked. Like, what happened? This was this was way after that. We were 
both, uh, we were in the same age group, so we were both 16 at the time that we did this camp. So I wasn't gonna say anything to her about it, you know? Some time had passed. And um, she had started doing YouTube a couple years after I started it. And naturally she did way better than me, right? Understandable. But after a while she stopped. I don't know, her, her views were really down and her motivation I think was the views. But I, I can't say for sure, that's just my guess, I don't know. I never stopped. No matter how, how low my views were, no matter how much of a struggle it was to do YouTube, it never affected my motivation in the slightest. Like it never affected my motivation to make videos. It affected my motivation to upload and stuff like that but my making videos i was always always recording and always editing but yeah ariba lakani i wonder if i can get back in touch with her see despite being very iffy with me i'll always have her back if she ever decides to get back into youtube best believe i'm helping her out in the video that i showed you there is no iffiness between us it was just like like that's her we were just all chill there was no iffiness between me and anybody in that camp as far as I was concerned, actually, she completely forgot who I was. And like, keep this in mind for later, okay? Keep this whole thing. This whole story I just told you in mind. Oh, and also, I met up with uh, Inara, Il Inara Ali. This dude, bro. This dude. Well, uh, this girl. But like, dude is gender neutral. She, uh, she lived in my house for like 10 seconds. I think I talked about her before on stream. When I met her, she was just as skinny as I remembered. But it was cool to see her again. She was a guy. I think she was a, uh, I think she was a group guy. I thought for real her whole, like, life was in shambles considering like the situation with her parents and all that but yeah i guess she was doing okay i haven't talked about her before i don't think i think i mentioned her but i don't think i talked about the story of like when she lived at our place and she was like a, a, a foster sister for like a little while but i'll tell that story one day so i get picked as the swim guide the logistics for camp can be like really hectic and stuff everyone has to do their part and this was like a new team that was doing it and they didn't really like have that much experience doing this stuff but it's like this is very you have to be strict if you want everything to go right in camp because like there are no substitutes for the rules like everybody has a very essential role and nobody can miss out on it you can't get sick so they had these rules in place, like no sleepovers, no showing up late, no missing even a day of training. And also you had to tell them your carpool situation. You can't just like ride with whoever and just show up in a car when you said that you'd be riding with somebody else. So I was riding with Ishan. That's what I told them I'd be doing. So that's what I did uh, for like two days. Naturally, we were breaking all the rules here. It didn't last long. But after I became a swim guide, we met up at um, Azra's house. Maybe it was Eliza's house, I'm not sure. And we made t-shirts. We like bleached them, we painted them and all that. Um, I still have it, I'll show it. I'll get my webcam uh, next stream or a couple streams from now. I'll get my webcam and I'll show it. But yeah, I was just enjoying my time. I was still hard focused on like having a productive summer. But when I was with the swim team, I shift my focus. And I would always ask them for stories that they had. I would ask Eliza for stories. I didn't need any stories about Sheza since I like knew her since we were little. Um, but I asked Azra and Nida for stories as well. They're sisters. Did I mention that? I, I, no, I didn't mention that. At this point, I was, I was attentive to what was going on. By the way, I can't swim for shit. In fact, I don't even know if I could float anymore. Like, it's really bad. They picked us, like, randomly. They didn't know that I couldn't swim. I did learn how, like, very quickly. Because I, I took classes when I was little, and I just practiced the, um, you know, technique. I just trusted the process. But I don't know if I could do it intuitively. Oh, and remember how I said I had bad memories of the cold showers when I was a participant? Well, this time, I knew, like, that was going to change. I took mostly warm showers. But being the swim guide, you have to spray water on all the participants, one by one, to, like, clean them off of all the chlorine so that they can, like, go to the lockers, dry up, and change. So I was going to have to deal with a lot of cold water on my skin. And surprisingly, I got used to it. In fact, even like to this day, I, I could still take a cold shower and it wouldn't be a problem. Like that, that stayed with me. That still stayed with me. You don't need to, um, like if you want to, if you want to do it, you don't think about like, okay, I need to go in slowly or I need to go in quickly. Just as long as you go in, you're all good. The way I would recommend, if you want to take a cold shower, the way I'd recommend doing it is like, you don't have to do this, but just try it out. Put your hand in the water until it gets warm. Like, you know how your, your body adjusts, like you put your hand in cold water and then it feels warm after a while and make sure you just like breathe like slowly. And you'll probably want to start shivering if, it, if the water is cold enough. You don't have to make it that cold. Just make it like a little less cold than like normal, normal water, you know? Cold, cold in room temperature. But let yourself shiver, right? Do, do whatever you got to do, but like breathe, breathe deeply. And then once the shivering is slowed down, or control your breath. And once you stop shivering, or just shiver very little, then put your arm in, your whole arm in, and do the same thing. And you'll shiver much less when you've already went in a little bit. And then you put your shoulder. And once your shoulder's in, you just, you can go all in. You can put your back in there and just go all in. And the key to doing this, I think, is to take long and deep breaths. Not like long, actually, that's not, maybe, but 
Just breathe properly and don't let the cold water screw up your breathing. If you do that, you'll be fine. I think I don't, that's what works for me, okay? I'm sure there's some science to, to corroborate at least somewhat of what I said. Maybe there's some Wim Hof method of breathing that you could like easily look up, but try it though. There's no harm in it. You know, they, they have that phase like, oh, uh, don't try this at home. Nah, like do try this at home. And you might as well give it a shot, you know? I spent a lot of time in these showers. Oh wait, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, in training, in training. That was during the camp, so in training, we had some fun moments, you know, doing little skits, making chants, eating out outside uh, as a tribe. They're like, dun, 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 those mosh pits, like breaking boundaries and shit like that. But the highlight of camp was the sleepovers, not just like the training, the highlight of camp in general. Every single training day, we would meet up at somebody else afterwards. The first one was Ariba's, and then the next person, I don't remember and then it was the next person and so on. I went to so many people's houses, bro. It was hard to even remember who like one by one. Oh, I should also preface this. I should talk about the uh, Hong Kong situation. So Hong Kong means shout out, okay? Just uh, just to preface this. So at the end of the day, each day of uh, training and camp, I believe, we would do this thing where they would pass out sticky notes where we can go to the front, we could take sticky notes. We could write on there uh, in Sharpie like, oh, Hong Kong to this person for doing this awesome thing. Then we give it back to the LPTs and we all like sit in a circle or whatever, sit a debrief, whatever it ends up being. And the LPTs read out them all like one by one. It's like a team building exercise or something, I don't know. Um, well, they read out the appropriate ones at least. They left out some of the good ones. So on the first day I got no Hong Kongs. Not that I was upset about it. I mean, like I wasn't active. I wasn't going for, I, I wasn't putting any mental energy into it. I knew I was, I was not surprised by it. But remember this Hong Kong thing for later, okay? Remember this, like keep that in the back of your head. The second day of training, I was riding with Ishan and we're on the highway and uh, this dude pulled up and he wanted to race us. He revs his car, well, hey, hey, race us. So we beat him. And then you know how like when you, when you race somebody, you beat them, you go way past them. So you hit the brakes, you slow down a bit, go back to speed limit, go back to five over 10 over whatever. And then they keep going so that they can in their minds somewhat pretend to, the, they can convince their like stupid ass minds. Like, oh, I actually won. Their car slowed down, even though they clearly saw your brake lights. So many people do that when they're racing, when they're kids. Um, the, oh, I clearly won, I went past you. No, just going past someone doesn't mean you won. We, we start off at a roll, we start off at a, at a 60, 80 roll, whatever it is, and you lost. So we slow down, we don't care, it's not worth it for us. This dude, uh, Ishan is in a, um, I don't know if it was lowered or not, but it was a, a G37 coupe, you know, the basic like uh, smoked lights, plastic dip logo, plastic dip wheels, that sort of thing. Okay. So this dude, that was the dude we were racing. So he goes way ahead and then he gets pulled over. Like we race, we win, and then he gets pulled over. It's okay. <laughs> that was a that was a funny moment right there. I didn't ride with him for that long. After this point I was I did ride with him like later on throughout the camp and things like that, but it wasn't like a, a I was like carpooling with him. I would just get rides from hella people. I never drove myself even once. I, I could have, but I never did. But basically what I did is I had a bag um, and I had one pair of jeans in there. I had three pairs of swimming shorts and I had one pair of boxers, which was a stupid idea. I should have had more. And I had my um, toothbrush and that's it. I didn't have toothpaste. I didn't have a t-shirt. I didn't have socks. I didn't have anything else. I didn't have my charger or anything either. But I didn't, I didn't need a lot of that stuff. I basically only wore my swimming shorts anyways. I didn't even wear the jeans the majority of the time throughout the camp like we would like the way it would work is that we'd wake up at like 5 a.m 6 a.m whatever i'd be in swimming shorts when i woke up uh we would get to camp so i'd be ready from the start everybody else would take time to get ready not me i would just keep it on we do all of our camp activities i would dry my shorts i'd wear them on the ride to someone else's house and then I'd go sleep there only to change swimming shorts again the next morning by the way i found out like the best way to dry your swimming shorts. And I, I still have those swimming shorts. I still keep them in my bag. Literally, wherever I go, I'm always ready. Like, I only have a few things in my bag that I take, like, as my daily carry. One of them is swimming shorts. I don't even carry, like, boxes or anything like that or any of that, but I always carry swimming shorts no matter where I'm at. I'm always prepared. I was experimenting with a lot of different ways to dry your shorts because you have to do it several times throughout the day. And I figured out the most efficient way, um, like, all of this, like, rubbing your shorts with a towel and all this stuff doesn't really do very much. There's, um, there's two ways I'd recommend. The less efficient way is to first, like you dry off your upper body and then you take your towel and you wrap it in between your legs. You wrap it around, you wrap it in between, whatever you squeeze, you like do like a, a hip abduction, uh, like um, basically do those like dynamic stretches that you would do if you plan on doing a hip abduction type of exercise, working out glutes basically. You basically work out glutes uh, while you have the towel 
wrapped around your legs like a resistance band, basically. And uh, if you apply pressure like that, it works the same way as like when you like uh, wring out clothes to like wring out all the moisture out of it. But that's the best way if you have no sunlight. If you have sunlight, you stand in the sun. That's the best way to do it because it really like it, it dries it. It doesn't just get rid of the uh, water inside. It, it gets rid of all the moisture. It dries it completely. We had our we had our camp at uh, Emory University in Georgia. This was it. This is how it looked. This was like the 16 feet area. That's where the lockers are. That's how you get to the lockers. This pool was on the bottom floor, by the way. This is like the very bottom floor and you leave out here and there's like a huge area down there where there's like nothing else around. It's like just the pool. And I'm sure there's other stuff down there, but it was like during summer, like everything else was like clothes and all that stuff. Basically while, while we were there, there was nothing else going on in the entire floor. There was the occasional swimmer um, who would like come in back and forth who had their stuff in the lockers. They would go use the laundry machines, dry their clothes, whatever. Um, but it was very, it was like in free Frequent. You know, it only happened like five or six times throughout the entire camp that we were there. But um, anybody who's seen Emory University or been there um, knows what I'm talking about. There's like a huge area with tons of space. And I still remember how it was like completely isolated from everything. I remember how it felt, how like open it felt. Because the pool is like crazy. It was like an Olympic pool. And like even when you're outside of it, there's like so much of a chlorine smell in the air. And I would walk out. I'd be wearing dry clothes with like wet hair. After like, you know, after you, after you swim for a while, you're like hungry and all that. I'd walk out like that, stomach growling, the vibe, like I didn't have any shoes or socks on. Cause like we were there the whole day. I didn't need to wear them until the end where we had to leave. And I could still feel like the, the smell of the air, the openness, the carpet between my toes. Like I would run around there. It was such a vibe, dude. It was such a vibe. That was the spot. You won't know that kind of, you won't know that vibe until you've been there. It's a totally unique vibe. I haven't experienced that kind of vibe anywhere else, but uh, everybody else, we were the only ones there. By the way, that's what, I think that's what made it such a crazy vibe. Everybody else was on the top floors. It was only the swim team that was on the bottom. Because we were like, we had our own privacy there. And they told us, oh, we're only going to use these lockers. But none of the other lockers are being used. So I could keep all my stuff in the rest of the lockers that we weren't allowed to use. But nobody would notice. Like nobody, it's nothing to worry about. Literally nobody else was there. We had the whole place to ourselves. For I would yell and shit and like dance. Because like nobody else is around. And the girls took forever to get ready and to dry themselves. So I had like a couple hours a day where I had like basically half a football field of carpeted area all to myself. Giant ceiling. Actually, the ceiling was gone. It showed the upper. F so yeah, like during training, I would go from uh, house to house, car to car. Like I was living like a hitchhiker. And I remember at one particular house, this is important to the story. I believe it was Anam Ali's house. There was a pool in the back and stuff. I'm not exactly sure whose house it was. I think it was Anand's. But I was getting ready to sleep on the sofa. It's like 2.30 a.m. or something like that. And I hear this like crew talking next to me. Well, they're on the sofa with me. They were talking about like, oh, there might be a, a rat in the group chat. Like a snitch telling the LPTs about our sleepovers. And I remember hearing that because it made sense. Remember, we're all breaking the rules. And I, I think even making a separate group chat would be against the rules. I don't know if there's a rule for it, because I don't know if there's a precedent for it, but it, it definitely would be against the rules um, to make a group chat without the LPT. And what's weird is whenever people wanted to have sleepovers or invite people or whatever, people would post in there, like three to five people every night would post, oh, I'm having a sleepover. Yo, anyone trying to come through? And then people would decide who whose sleepover they wanted to go to. They'd basically RSVP in that group chat. That's what it was for, it was for breaking the rules. However, every time people would have sleepovers, uh, particularly like, not even just like hanging out or whatever, but whenever people had sleepovers, the LPTs somehow always knew about it. We noticed that uh, they would try to be really slick. They didn't say anything to the people who weren't active in the group chat, but whenever people were like, at like a pretty major sleepover or whatever, or um, they ended up showing up like a little bit late or whatever. They're like, so uh, they would try to imply that like, they would try to bring up the rules again. Oh, by the way, sleepovers are not allowed or whatever. They were like trying to be really slick, but we kind of noticed like, hey, they might, it's like somebody might be telling them what's going on. So we started to suspect people. And um, that's where the conversation started. And I was only like half asleep. I wasn't asleep all the way, but they like kind of woke me up and they're like, hey, what do you, what do you think? And then we decided to leave that place um, and meet up with some people at a, Rhea Merchant's house. I think it was because we may have suspected that someone there at Anam's house that night might be the rat. There's too many suspects, so you know, we gotta, we, we only gathered the people that we could absolutely trust. Legit, we were on that like splinter cell shit, dude. We, I, we felt like a fucking detective. And I remember, um, I believe we were watching the Olympics at Rhea's house, uh, and the conversation was continued over there. And it was like 10 people or so. And now, 
at this point, we had our suspects pretty narrowed down by the time we got there because we were talking in the car and all that. I was pretty much asleep for the majority of the time, so I wasn't really contributing much to the conversation. I was just like listening in here and there. So we had our suspects and then we started to investigate. I was doing none of this. I was watching the Olympics, getting ready to fall asleep. But they were going through the group chat, uh, the group me group chat to see like um, any patterns of anything. And we realized there's one person, one person who lines up pretty perfectly with knowing information, with that same information being exposed to the LPTs that they go off on us for. And you know who it is? Ariba motherfucking Lakani. The person who threw the first sleepover and who made the original group chat to begin with. And if she was indeed the rat, that would have been top 10 anime betrayals of 2016, all right? She was the last person we expected. But everything lined up. The first sleepover, we, we thought about it, the first sleepover was bait. It was all planned out beforehand. And she made the group chat so quickly. We, we, nobody had even talked about the fact that we needed a separate group chat. She just made it. So we had our prime suspect. After all, she was like super good friends with um, one of the LPT named Anusha Charania. And while we were searching the group chat, we were looking for patterns because the group chat was huge. So many people were talking in it. One of us found buried deep in the, in the time machine of the group chat archive. It was like very, very early when she was still adding members. It said LPT member Anusha Charania was added to the group chat when LPTs weren't even supposed to know this existed only to immediately Anusha Charania left the group chat. So she noticed and she left. And guess who added her? Ariba motherfucking Lakani. We had our rats. Now, I'm not gonna speak on the morality of betraying the trust people put in you by ratting them out, deceptively hiding stuff from them while uh, being fake enough to pretend like you're still on the same team as them. I'm not going to speak on the ethics of that, okay? It's not time for that conversation. I still got people around me who are like fans of Takashi, who are like, oh, Takashi 6 9 goaded, bro, he's the go. He's, they say cringe shit like that. They dick ride whoever's popular just because they're popular. I'll wait until they uh, bandwagon on some newer trends and leave Takashi alone. Uh, I'll wait on that till I, to, to hurt their feelings after that. Tell them that like, hey, Takashi's actually a fucking piece of shit for that. So Ariba was the rat and we were all kids. Like we, I can't blame her for it. Like she's probably grown into a totally different person at this point. So her and Anusha Charania were friends. It's funny because I left such a terrible impression on Anusha that her little sister like basically threatened me after that, after all this stuff happened. And you know what? During a separate camp, during this like this one day lockdown thing, I had Anusha again as my counselor. Her little sister is um, Alma Charania. I think I maybe mentioned her before. I never talked about her legit. And the three of them were friends. Well, kinda. You know how it goes. It's complicated, right, chat? You know the deal. I got a story about Alma too. I can't remember what it was. I, I know I have a story. I think I have multiple. I remember the story. It was, uh, it was funny. I'll tell it next after this. Okay, yeah, so Ariba's the rat. So I start telling people that I'm cool with, like uh, Reza, Remu, and them, and the swim team, and stuff like that. And they go like, yeah, it makes sense. They are pretty close friends. They were like the closest of friends. So we know for sure who's behind it now. We have it confirmed. We don't know if there's another rat. We doubt it, but I mean, she's the one. She made the group, to, she's the catalyst behind all this. And on that day of investigation at Ria's house, we um, overslept. Well, I didn't, but um, the rest of them did. I, I tend to, when I'm in these environments, I tend to be able to wake up pretty easily. We head out and we show up like 20 minutes late to training that day. And they like chewed us out for like a couple seconds, basically in front of everyone, all like 10 of us. But regardless, it had been a very productive night. And like if everybody, if like a group of 10 people walk in at the same time and they're all late, it can be implied, it can be inferred that uh, there was a sleepover. So yeah, at, after this point, all of the pieces were in place. This is all the prefacing I need to do. And I knew like, okay, time to have a bit of fun. Time to see what this camp has to offer to me, you know? Time to take advantage of my opportunities, my situation here. Now, I had this special combination going for me. First, I wasn't 
afraid to be bold. Second, I was pretty much universally liked by everyone. And people were cool with like giving me rides and letting me stay at their place overnight. And third, I was a part of the swim team, which meant I had the whole floor to myself, no supervision from the LPT or any security there. Cause like they were already spread thin as it was at that point. There's no point in like sending people all the way down to the pool area just to supervise a group of like five kids. Uh, especially when like two of the kids are like actual adult adults, you know? And so all these things combined, these three things put me in this really unique position to take advantage of the utmost freedom that nobody else at the camp had. I gotta mention this, every single day, because of my position, I would get all the leftovers from everything. We had like occasional sweets and stuff like that. And the LPTs were kind of like, they didn't have very much self-control. They're like millennials and shit, you know? So it's like they themselves were not um, about to be like super strict on the camp, not uh, like, like actually being healthy and shit, you know? So there would be sugary stuff quite a lot. And I remember there was one day where we ended off with cupcakes um, and we thought we didn't have enough. So we cut all the cupcakes into halves and each person got half a cupcake. You know, that's cool, whatever, right? So we had a box of them. Um, and this was as people were leaving and we were like handing out the cupcakes to everybody. Pretty much after the majority of people left, like after all the guides and most of the counselors were gone, uh, it's like me and a couple of LPT and like a few people left, a couple of logistic people and stuff. And I decided to get a ride at one of the counselors. I'm not sure who that was. No, no, no. I think it was with Rayhan because I remember I was in a Jeep, but this was my strategy. It was like, wait for only a few counselors to be left. So that way when there's only a handful, it's like more intimate. I had an understanding of the bystander effect at the time. So I'm like, I don't want to, uh, I want to make them feel like it's a bit more pressing that I'm left behind and I don't have a car. So then I'll ask them for a ride. So I did that. I waited till there was only a few people left and it did give them a bit of a hard time, but the method didn't work when I, when, um, I tried to do it where there was a lot more people around. They'd be like, oh no, I can't, I, got, I don't get time. So I was, I was playing the strategy game at this point in the camp. And because on this day they had like leftovers of cupcakes, cause they kind of didn't do the math right. And I was like universally liked and I was the youngest one there who had stayed that late. They let me keep all the leftover cupcakes and they miscalculated so much that it turns out there were like 10 halves left, which meant like five full cupcakes. Bro, I should have just called EDP over, told him I had extra. That would have been the good ending, the good timeline. But yeah, they let me take the box, the whole box with me. And I finished them all on my uh, ride back to someone's house. I don't know who I went with. I was riding in the Jeep uh, Wrangler, but um, I don't remember whose house I ended up at. It's all kind of a blur at this point. <laughs> so, what the, see, that's my hand. You can tell because of how skinny it is. So yeah, I ate this one at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And you know what? I liked vanilla better than I like chocolate. And I still do. I still, I love vanilla way more than chocolate. So I'm so glad everybody ate the chocolate ones. But yeah, I ate all of these. Damn, bro, this is like, I'm, I'm gonna leave that picture up there actually. This is legit EDP's dream camp, bro. Underage kids and cupcakes. That's like a buy one, get one free. Damn, I shouldn't even make EDP jokes right now. But actually, I should. That's a classic joke. It's cupcakes. But um, I was hopping from house to house, car to car. Uh, I spent like a little over a week actually not seeing my like family even once. Or like even going to my house. Or even talking on the phone with them or with anyone. Because like I didn't carry a charger. And my phone died like a couple days into the camp. And I only got the chance to charge it like another two times throughout the camp. It was like straight hitchhiker just super intimate i was always just in the in the moment you know never on my phone never thinking about other things i could dedicate a lot of my brain power to the situation at hand and that's what i did it was like the i spent a good chunk of my time just like relaxing like i would walk around emory a lot because remember everyone was on the upper floors and it was like super hectic and uh they couldn't be bothered to um keep the swim team organized they just figured that like we'd handle ourselves without supervision you know because like there were also out of the five of us it was also a female majority there's three females and two males and one of the males was um the like older brother kind of archetype that like they all knew of like he's going to be responsible no matter what he doesn't need to be supervised and this is like a good decision on the camp's part to to like allocate more resources to the areas where it tends to get more out of hand because when the uh when the participants come down to the pool then there's other counselors and there's other guides and there's other safety people and there's lifeguards and all that stuff so then they show up, but when there's no, uh, when there's nothing going on and we're just chilling in, in the bottom part, I mean, we're allowed to like go around, go upstairs, do whatever. It would just be weird if we interfered with other people, but it's like such a huge area and so many steps to like walk up there that like going up and down repeatedly would be like inconvenient for most people. I didn't care. I enjoyed the walk, but it was a good decision on their, on their part to dedicate all of their staff and all of their security resources 
to every place except for the swimming area. The only miscalculation on their part was that they didn't consider the fact that I'm me. If it was anybody else, they would have been totally fine. It would have been a good investment on their part, investment of resources. Actually, it wasn't the only miscalculation. The camp could have done a lot of things better. And it's not even like, you wouldn't expect me, especially considering I'm admitting right now that I was like a menace to the camp, even I can improve on things. Just overall decision making. Like I even saw one of the dudes later, like Azim Master and this other dude in the airport like a year later and they were like, so like, what, what, what's the deal? What'd you, why was Mosaic all like that? And I told them, I'm like, it was just a bad ratio. Like you guys didn't handle things right. Like you guys did not handle logistics right. Kids were getting lost all over the place. And it's like, I made the camp fun for the kids. If you guys had handled everything right, then you would have the right to speak about me screwing around with the camp. But you guys didn't handle it right and you didn't make it fun. At least I made it fun. At least I did something that you guys did. And the dude was like, you always got an answer for everything. I, I, I think I could make the camp a bit. Mm, some would not consider it better, but I would consider it better. But then anyone can make the camp what they, can, they themselves consider it better. Like, after what I saw of the situation with the swimming thing, I firmly believe that like Camp Mosaic um, and other camps like it should always allocate more females than males to handle swimming. Um, and actually, they should handle almost all females if they're even going to have any males at all. And they should only be the safest, the absolute safest females to handle swimming. If there was any less girls, it would have been way too chaotic. They probably would have needed to put some staff down there. I could barely handle like the situation that I was in. Like the, the kids would, would troll you. Like it's hard to discipline them in the water. I remember some of the kids would um like pretend like they were drowning. If it was all, all guys instead of three girls and one guy, some of the kids probably would have drowned. But yeah, I'll... Uh, Mm. It would be it would be a bit egocentric of me to say that I know what's better for the camp because I know people that would go no what you want for the camp is actually not what I want for the camp and ultimately it's just what I would want for the camp saying it's better is um it's a bit arrogant to say it's not my place to say that sort of thing after all I only I was only a guide and I only went there once as a guide and I was only a guide for swimming I wasn't like a I didn't have like a super major role you know and actually I wasn't even I was hardly even a guide at that I would really take advantage of my situation. I, I, I didn't do the stuff that the other guides did. Like they had like a storage room, like full of like uh, food and snacks and like only staff people and like the food people were allowed to go in there. And everybody else had like supervision, like the groups had supervision and all the counselors had supervision. The sports guides had supervisions. The swim team didn't, we were the only ones. And so I would go upstairs and just like casually walk into the snack room. Uh, nobody else would be there because like they didn't expect anybody else to be there. But I would just walk in there, take like a jar of peanut butter and just like finish that whole shit in like a day. Bro, I, I actually nearly threw up from the amount of snacks I was eating. Sometimes other people came up with me. Sometimes it was, it was rare though. Occasionally you'd see somebody like leave their position or whatever and you know, things would be taken care of on their end, like on autopilot basically, and they'd come with me. Sometimes, um, there was a couple times where Eliza came with me and we took like that huge, huge box of goldfish and stuff. But that shit was unreal. Like the gallon things of goldfish, it would, it's so difficult to eat so many of those, but like she was able to keep up with my pace of eating goldfish. No, I've never seen anyone like do it at the same pace as me. Like she ate just as much as me. I'm impressed actually. Cause we legit finished all of that goldfish in like two, three days. But yeah, it was a, it was a vibe. It was a vibe. I was, I was just, I'd say about a third of my time was spent going around, just exploring, going on little uh, side quests, little mini adventures. I became friends with um, a few of the college students, not, not necessarily, I became acquainted with the college students, but I became friends with some of the college staff and I became friends with some of the uh, staff of another camp that they were doing in Emory at the time, because I went to that camp, the same camp um, earlier that summer. It was ID Tech camp, which I'll, I'll talk about later. I also became friends with uh, a couple of the people in the college staff. In particular, there was this one lady who um, managed the uh, the giant laundry machines. And I also became friends with a couple of the patrol dudes. But dude, the Emory laundry machines are a fucking miracle, dude. Like it makes you realize how shitty all the other laundry machines are. like. The way it would be is like huge, huge laundry machines. Like they had ones that were like legit taller than me. The circles were like five feet. I wonder what those laundry machines were. I kind of want some because every other laundry machine is so garbage compared to them. Like it's like, it's like that meme where there's like a, it's like this meme right here. This is the, this is the laundry machines at Emory. And this is the laundry machines uh, that everybody else has in their homes and their apartments and shit. Oh, I can't take lights and darks together at the same time. I'll mix up the clothes. And, and you, you can't put like a month's worth of clothing 
you gotta you gotta split it up into like two different loads you gotta put only like two weeks at a time uh, and, and you know after you you wash the clothes you gotta put it in the dryer you gotta take it from washer to dryer afterwards and that takes like an extra hour like nah dude like this is what we had at emory bro i would legit like I would walk out, I would hand my swimming shorts to the lady there. Um, I changed and everything. I'd hand my swimming shorts to the lady. She'd throw it in the machine. Since like nobody else was there and she didn't mind helping me out. And then I'd walk upstairs, I'd like go up there, grab some gummy snacks or whatever, walk back down. She'd hand me my swimming shorts, like washed and dried. And the time it took me to walk upstairs and back down, it was done. Clean, ready to go, ready to use again. So I could be ready for uh, when the next group came. Like, God damn, dude. Every luxury apartment complex, in my opinion, should have an area where people could just like bring their laundry and there's a person at the front desk there who could just like put it in the machines for them. That shit made me feel like such a king, dude. But I mean, like it wasn't intended for us. And really the way I'd, I would just flirt with the girl at the, like she was like a college student or something like doing that as a part-time job or something like that. And I don't think she knew I was underage. But yeah, I'm sure those machines are actually meant for like commercial size loads of like chlorine filled bathing suits like sweat and chlorine filled bathing suits of like a hundred different swimmers and and they can all they can clean it all like super quickly and flawlessly all at once i definitely was not supposed to be using those machines i know that but god damn those machines were awesome i wish i, I want to get some of those machines in my place i'm gonna i'm gonna make a note of that should i make a note no nah, i'll remember if it's important i'll remember but um yeah i had a lot of freedom i, I walked around i blasted music and like nobody else could do this just perks of being on the swim team i guess I should also mention, they called me Afubai, because um, bi means bro, bi means brother. But like, if you say it like bi, like B-H-A-I, but like, you don't worry so much about the emphasis on the H. Like people in America just go like Afubai. And it's because these dudes who uh, were older than me, who knew me since I was little, who would like come to my house and like my mom would go, Afu, come here, whatever. And they'd hear that and they'd like tease me and make fun of me, the same way you do with your friends. So they started to just call me that and everybody else in the camp started to call me that too. Oh shit, I made a mistake, I shouldn't have said that. Now people in chat are gonna call me a foo from now on. Well, too late to stop it now. I swear, I need a kill switch for my stream or I need to turn on stream delay actually. Holy shit, oh well, a foo it is. I think people are gonna forget it uh, pretty soon, so. Dude, I can't believe I just fucked that up, dude. Okay, so moving on. The swim team, let me go through the roster, okay? First was Azra. She had a sister who was also a counselor. Her, her sister um, was like, she was always walking around and, and I think she was like some, she was managing a lot of stuff. So we, I'd see her whenever I went up to um, the uh, storage room to like get some snacks or food or whatever. Her name was Doc. Actually, it wasn't Doc. It was uh, Nida Moldina, but uh, we called her Doc. And I think it was because she wanted to become a OGBYN or some shit like that. You think it's a OBGYN? No, you're wrong. It's OGBYN. It's I'm I'm telling you I'm I'm correct. You guys, it's OGBYN is what it is. It's OG Balian niggas. That's what it stands for. So yeah, we called her Doc. I, I did see her occasionally after that, but um, I don't know if she ever ended up doing that. I don't know if she ever ended up becoming a doctor. But even like years later, even when, when she was supposed to become a doctor by that point, I still just called her Doc. Yeah, those two were cool. Azra was um dating this other dude named Ashis. This is how I know the bystander effect is a real thing because when this dude told me he was gonna give me rides, and I asked him, and he flaked on me on three separate occasions. He was over three. And he basically forced other people who had a much more inconvenient situation to give me rides instead. Like, bro, be a man of your word. Like, he was an actual adult by that time. So, I keep going off on tangents. I need to, I need to, like, I'm not operating off much sleep right now. But, um, the other counselor, so there were two counselors. The other counselor was Juju. And he was cool. He knew how to swim. But yeah, I, I, I didn't know much about him. And I still don't. Azra, I, I knew and I saw even after camp. Just like how I saw Anita. Um, Azra told me a very interesting story about a, uh, a sin that was committed. Uh -huh. And it's a sin that I cannot say. And I still talk to both of them like very, very sparsely. In fact, the place where she told me the story was um, in the USIG video in the uh, 2019. I'll actually pull it up right now. They, they, this is, this is neither of them. That's her. Azra is right here. She's on the left of me. And she goes like, okay, so you're his paparazzi. You can hear her. Listen. <laughs> And she goes, and I'm her paparazzi. Okay. Is that how that works? I guess. You're taking pictures? Are you doing video? Yeah. So this is, this is Nida. Okay. Yeah, right in the front. I was, yeah, I was <laughs> like, bro, calm down. They're like yelling like who? Like, if I yeah. had an in your mic, then I would have yeah. been. In your monitor, not in your mic. I, I noticed that when she said that. That 
bothered me that she said that. And then that's Azra. She looks so different in this picture than she in this than she did um back in Mosaic. Like she looks super different. And she looks older than her sister, right? No. Nah. Her sister Nida is three years older than her. She was eighteen at the time and Nida was twenty one at the time. So I still saw them occasionally. Like she would um uh, Nida would come to my house to record with Faraz and stuff. It was just very it was very sparse and it was only for the purpose of recording music and stuff. Because like she sang. Juju didn't leave much of an impression actually. He did leave an impression, but it's not like I ever talked to him after. No, I did talk to him one time after that, um, where I showed up to, I don't know what the hell, I showed up to like GSU, not because I was going, I, I didn't go to college, I didn't go to GSU, and I was just hanging out with a few college kids, and he was just there in the dorm, like he had like moved to Atlanta, and even the main LPT guy, like Anis Bamani or something like that, he had moved there as well, and he was also like living there, and we like played Smash Bros and stuff. But yeah, other than that, he didn't really leave much of an impression. And then the rest of the team was um, the guides, which was like, there was me, the tried and true hooligan at heart, and then Eliza. Holy shit, dude. Eliza, like, okay, listen, she looked normal, and I'm not really into brown bros like that, but when she had wet hair, like, holy, f is it just me? Like, that can't just be me. Like, whenever any of those girls had wet hair, that would instantly double their ranking, at least. I don't know what the hell it was. I don't know why that did it, but like, Eliza, dude. <clears throat> she went from like a two to a seven with wet hair like actually different person And I also learned at this camp that uh, it takes a long time for girls hair to dry off Like I couldn't comprehend what took them so long to get out of the locker rooms Like I tell them I'd like text them while I was out there. I'd be like, hey, yo, what y'all doing? Come outside. Let's hang out after they'd come out I'd see like day after day even after I dried my hair like completely they'd walk out with like still soaked hair and they'd still keep a towel on them even after they walked, even after like 20 minutes. And I'm like, this is the first time hearing about this. Like if girls complain so much about guys rushing them, why don't they just explain this? Cause I had no idea. If you just had told me this, I wouldn't be rushing you so much. And lastly is um, Shaza. Bro, she was such a bitch to me, dude. But I don't really mind. I don't really like, it's not, she was like um, a minor annoyance. Bitch to me is like a bit over, over the, that's like a bit of, bit of an exaggeration. Like she was cool, you know? I think I'd still be cool with her to, to this day. I don't know if she'd be cool with me, but I'd be cool with her. Actually, there was the Pierce example of her being like, like this like sort of like, I don't know how you describe it, but like, okay, see, again, there's no supervision. We're all on our own here. Um, so the rest of the groups were like off doing something. And like, we had finally had a break. We got like a one hour break this day where they separated like, okay, in between groups three and four, we're gonna give you guys a one hour break. And like swimming takes a toll, you guys, like we were tired. So we found this like one soft bench on like the floor above. It was in between the place where uh, where we would do uh, the debriefs and the place where we where there was like the more intimate stuff where where they did all the mason jars and stuff like that. In between there, there was like these like sofas. I show up and I I'd, like there was actually like one main sofa and like the rest were like chairs and stuff. I get there first and I lay down on like the sofa and I'm just chilling like about to fall asleep and I know like when it comes time for me to fulfill my responsibilities. Somebody will come looking for me, yelling at me like, hey, what are you doing? Get back to, so I knew somebody was gonna, like it, during transition, they were gonna wake me up, right? And so I'm just, I'm, I'm ready to fall asleep. And she shows up like 30 seconds to a minute after me. And she's like two feet tall, okay, keep that in mind. I'm six feet at this point. I, I stopped growing pretty early. I was, I was six feet by the time I was 16. And uh, I've stayed six feet this entire time. And this couch can like barely hold me um, I'm kind of curled up on it actually. It's like kind of a small couch and there's a, there's like ottoman footrest thing that like goes with the couch that like she could totally fit on but I can't. I'm too big for it. And she goes like, get up. I want to sleep here. And I'm like, what? No, just sleep on this, the ottoman thing. And she's like, be a gentleman. That's not very gentleman-like of you or whatever. I don't think she said it this many times but like in my head she's like, real gentlemen give up their seat for a lady. I don't think See, I was already like super tired. I think it just um, ticked me off in my head. So I think I, I made it sound more annoying than it actually was. I think in my memory, it's, I, I warped it to be something that it wasn't. I think she may have just said the word gentleman once, but that word just like really stuck with me. No, I think she actually said like, if you're a gentleman, you'd give up your seat for the lady. At the, at the time, I'm like, I'm relaxed. I'm like halfway into like plunging myself into the depths of REM sleep, just like listening to this bullshit, thinking to myself like, really? Real gentlemen give up their seat for the lady? Bitch, I bet you ladies nuts across your face. I, 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 like, bro, I was really on that Cosmo shit, bro. I was really in my head. I was like, at least grow to be a lady first. I know we're both kids, but like, I yearn for the day we, that we can have true gender equality, bro. Bitches always want to talk.
talk about equality, but then switch it over to being a man only when it's convenient to them. Pathetic. But I mean, like, she never did get me out of that seat, so. Like, she had no power over me. That's why I didn't mind, like, I'm not, like, mad at her for, like, the way she, I, 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 it's not like I didn't like, it's like a, 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 a little kid asking, like, hey, you got games on your phone? Like, it's like a mild annoyance, you know? It's not like you hate the kid afterwards. I was really on that Giga Chad, like, Cosmo mindset. She still tried, though. She still tried to get me out of that seat and tried to make me do many things like that. Like, this was not an isolated incident. Many times, even after camp, she would pester me. I remember, um, actually the funniest moment of, of training was, uh, when we were all together, all the counselors were like, uh, in their groups and me and the swim team were like all the way on the right of this like U shape. This was the room. And then there was another room right here. And then there was an area like this. This was like the downstairs area. This was a separate floor. And then this was like a railing. There was like a railing right here that you could see the downstairs area. And this was where the couch was. This was the couch I slept on. And this was the ottoman that she could have slept on, but she didn't. And this is the room where it was all like the intimate stuff was going on. That's where we did like the t-shirt signing and all that. Um, and I remember all this stuff when I went to camp. I remember this is where like the, did that freestyle and everything. So the way it was is like, so there was like the table right here and like the LPT stand around, you know, and we had already given our Hong Kongs and there was like a bunch of people, you know, in their groups in like a U shape like this. And this is the swim team. We're all the way right here. So um, the way it was, is it was like Juju, Azra, me, Sheza, and Eliza. And that's how we were sitting. Um, I don't remember the order of these two people, but that's me on the left, that's Sheza, that's Eliza. And we're like, basically, it's pretty cramped. So we're like, we're pretty much shoulder to shoulder in this situation. This was the actual funniest moment of, of training. So this was a debrief for that day. The LPTs were here and they were reading Hong Kongs. We'd already given all of our Hong Kongs to them and they were reading them out. I remember, so at this point I was getting a few Hong Kongs. Actually, I think I was getting more than anybody else every day. I think I was setting a new record each day that went by. So remember I said earlier, <coughs> they didn't read the inappropriate ones, but they kept them up there. And then um, that way, once they were done, you could all go up there, everybody, all the counselors and everybody would go up there and they take the sticky notes that uh, corresponded to them that were for them. They could see the ones that um, the um, LPT didn't read out out loud. On this day, I got like, I don't know, three or something separate Hong Kongs that were all trolls like, oh, a Hong Kong to a Fraz or a Afu. I've had eyes for you ever since the first day of training. Uh, I can't wait to see more of you during camp. Love your secret admirer. And like, they never read these. And these are obviously bait, right? One the guys I mentioned earlier, probably like Sami or Ishan, they probably wrote that shit. I got like three of them day after day. So one day I got like six of them, I think. And I knew they weren't going to read it because like they hadn't read it the day before and the day before that. So I was probably going to go up there and find some. But somehow one of them slips by and they accidentally start reading it and they're like, shit, I guess too late. So they finish it. And uh, everyone goes like, ooh, and it's like all in good fun. It's bait. It's a troll. Everyone knows that. And then immediately afterwards, there's another Hong Kong. It, it literally, the one raft that is, it's a Hong Kong from Ariz. And it says, oh, from Ariz, Hong Kong to everyone on the swim team. And it says, quote, it says, Hong Kong to everyone on the swim team, Juju, Azra, and Afu. And I'm sitting there with the people on the swim team next to me. And I notice Sheza and Eliza weren't even mentioned. They were forgotten. They're both sitting to my right. And under my breath, I go like, ha ha, he didn't say you guys. And Chesa goes like, shut up. And she like, I, I think she like slaps my arm or something like that, but it's like, it's whatever, you know, just banter is all it is. But apparently I was laughing while I was saying it. So I, I didn't whisper it on my breath. I said it a bit too loud and everyone was silent. So everyone heard that shit. Like all the other, everyone in the whole U shape heard that shit. Everyone started dying laughing. And like, I just embarrassed the fuck out of these two. And that made me laugh even more. And that made this whole like feedback loop of laughter. It was a weird roller coaster emotion. Like it went from people teasing me, like, ooh, we got a secret admirer, to none of the swim guides even matter other than off us. Straight NPCs, bro. And that shit was comedy gold. That was not even intentional. Like, Ariz is way too nice of a guy to ever do something like that, to ever intentionally leave them out. I have a picture here of Sheza. So this is Anusha Charania, by the way. This is Anis or something like that. I don't know. I don't remember his name. But he was like the lead LPT. This is uh, Iman. Yeah, Iman. Yeah. And this is Sheza. I think that's that's basically it for training. Some more stuff happened during training, like... Uh, Kazan Yukani decided to make an enemy out of me for literally no reason. I don't hold any grudges, so I don't really care. But like, I don't know why he was just such a bitch to me. What else? What else? What else? We would ditch the bottom four to go hang out with the groups um, that had the older kids in them. And like, we'd play keep away with them and shit. I even had one of the participants on Skype and we played video games together. Oh, wait, that, uh, never mind. It's not part of training. Okay, yeah. So that's everything for training, I think. It's everything I could think of. Okay, so the camp. First off, let me just say like, 
I was not expecting any of what actually happened to happen. Like, what you're thinking right now for what it would be like to be a swim guy to, to like, handle kids who are swimming, what you're picturing in your head, that's not how it is at all. First of all, it's, like, scary. Like, it's not relaxing. It's not like you're in a pool and you're having fun. Like, it's, like, the kids will, will, they'll mess with you, but they don't realize that, like, the jokes that they make in the pool, like, those kinds of jokes could, like, ruin your life with one little mistake. And you, it, you have to make, like, such, like, snap decisions. I should have known, because it's, like, obviously, you, you just swim, you, adults that manage kids who swim, it's your job to, like, keep them alive, right? But, like, you don't ever think about, like, oh, that's actually a huge responsibility to, to place on a 16-year-old, to, like, keep a, a group, like, a ratio of, like, another, like, 30 kids alive. It's a scary thing when um the kids start, like, messing with you, pretending like they're drowning and stuff like that. Like, they put their face underwater and float like they're dead. And uh, it would it would make me a bit, like, anxious, you know? It would make me a bit worried. And Azra warned us about this. Like, during training, she warned us that this would happen. And even though we knew it would happen, like, it wasn't any easier to deal with. And, like, I wasn't, like, technically an adult yet, but I was still, like, relative to them, I was an adult male because of the age difference. So I wasn't about to be here, like, dealing with these kids, like, oh, here, let me show you how to swim properly. Like, I wasn't about to be, like, touching up these kids and stuff like that, you know? There's a there's a bit of an age difference there. It was, like, few, few, years, I don't, it was varying. There's quite a bit of variation in the ages of the participants, depending on the group as well. But I was 16. If they're, if they're 14 or they're 13, I would be a, a rising junior uh, in, a rising sophomore or whatever. Yeah, rising sophomore, I think, in uh, high school. They'd still be in middle school. From that perspective, it is a huge, huge age difference at that age. I'm, I'm smart, bro. I'm not trying to um, give people the wrong idea, end up in some anime situation uh, where people will, like, walk in uh, and get a misunderstanding, like, oh, are you just helping them swim or are you... D-? No, none of that's going to happen. I had no fucking idea, though, how difficult it would be to, like, keep to myself and, and handle these kids. And I would, every time something would happen, I would call it to Azra. And she told me, like, hey, you're just a guy. Like, anything that happens, let me know and I'll deal with it. Because she was like the responsible 18 year old adult. I'm so grateful for her for that. And whenever a kid would like be pretend to be drowning, because they did it a lot in front of me, because they knew like, oh, I'm I'm like the chill one of the group. I'd point out to Azra, I'd be like, hey, uh, this is this, is he drowning? And Azra would be up there like outside the pool and she'd take a better look. She'd be like, oh no, he's faking it. Don't worry about it. And uh, she needed to tell me this so often. It was fucking stupid. And even then, even after she told me, it still scared the shit out of me, dude. I was not expecting there to be that many instances of that happening. It keeps you alert. Like, you're very sleep deprived during camp. I was not sleep deprived when that was happening, dude. My anxiety was through the fucking roof. Also, another thing, dude, I'm telling you, what you expect to happen is not what's going to happen in, in this kind of situation. A lot of the kids, you expect these kids to not even have developed a theory of mind yet, right? But no, a lot of these kids are still like extremely insecure. And it's like, they're kids, bro. There's nothing to be insecure about. Like, you don't, you, you're literally not even in your final form yet. What are you scared of? Like, nobody actually cares about, nobody's actually, I don't know how. Like, even when I was that age, I knew, like, nobody really cared about looking at me. Everybody was just focused on themselves and everybody was there to have fun. But, like, it was so weird that, like, okay, fine. Kids being shy about wearing a swimsuit in front of the opposite gender, fine, normal, whatever, right? But what's crazy is, like, kids were shy to change in the locker rooms in front of, like, their own, uh, their, like, guys were scared. Like, I don't know about girls, right? But the guys in the locker rooms were scared to change in front of other guys. And it's like, bro, at sleepovers, are, do you, like, bro, we were proud to change clothes in front of each other. Like, hey, bro, we're brothers. Doesn't mean, doesn't even matter. Who cares? We were on that filthy Frank way, bro. And you know what? Dude, even kids my age were scared and insecure. Like, adults. And I realized something. I'm like... This is a very important lesson, actually, that I'm glad I learned over there. It's like the actual state of your appearance has jack shit to do with how you perceive yourself. Some people I've, I've literally heard on multiple occasions, like you, you imagine yourself to look better than you actually do. And then I've heard other on other occasions, different posts will go like, oh, other people perceive your perceive you as looking three times better than you perceive yourself to look. And I'm like, so which is it? Which is it? It's two contradicting things. None of it's true. In reality, none of it's true. All that stuff is complete BS. There's no correlation in the slightest. Maybe on paper there's a correlation, right? But not in practice. Not at all. Not from what I've seen. Or at least, like, the stats aren't really all that applicable in any way. First of all, let's get this straight, okay? I had the worst body in that entire camp, okay? Guys and girls. Participants and counselors. I was six feet tall, and I weighed about 80 pounds or so, okay? Which meant I basically looked like Slenderman. 
Actually, I look skinnier than Slenderman. Even still to this day, I look a little skinnier. So I don't, I'm not as, as like long and my arms aren't, you know, down to my knees. His arms are like down to his ankles, bro. I'm not, I'm not like that, but from like a thickness level, I'm still skinnier than Slenderman, like actually. But yeah, there, there, um, there was an entire moment out of the entire camp where I felt scared to uh, be around anyone at the pool where I felt like covering myself up or anything like that, you know? Well, actually, there was one moment where I felt a bit... Uh, but it wasn't um, it wasn't because of, like, my body or anything. It was because of, like... Okay, okay. So if, you, if you're if you watching this and you end up doing Mosaic, right? Um, maybe because you searched up Camp Mosaic on YouTube and this video showed up. A word of advice to all the future swim guides. And you're going to want to pass this down to the next generation of swim guides. There's going to be a group of girls sitting on the side uh, of the pool, in the, in the pool lane right next to where everyone's swimming in. And they're not going to be inside. The, they're going to be sitting on, on like with their feet in the water, right? And you may be wondering why they aren't fully in the pool like everybody else. In fact, you may even be curious enough to ask, like, hey, what are you guys doing? Get in the pool. Don't ask. It's because of uh, natural bodily function is what they told me, along with an explanation. And it was an explanation that I couldn't really avoid because... I was Quidditch goalie, and I had to stay right next to them, and I didn't have the balls to tell them to stop. So yeah, that was a mistake. I mean, like, it doesn't matter now. I, I can talk about periods now, but when I was 16 years old, it was a different story, bro. I mean, dude, that was only a couple years after I was, like, after I had, like, a phobia of talking to girls. I was still recovering, dude, and just to explicitly say all that shit, even then, it's like, it's whatever. It is natural, natural bodily function. I didn't mind. But when I said to them, like, I was like, oh, why are you guys up there? And this girl was like, what do you think, huh? They were like somewhat hinting at it. And I was like, oh, never mind. I'm good. I don't need to know. Then they continued on. Once I figured out, they continued on just to tease me. Like they got a kick out of it. That's what did it. That's what made me like, um, like it wasn't their detailed explanation that made me uncomfortable. Like it's whatever, you know, it is natural bodily function, but it's the fact that they got a kick out of it. Like they enjoyed like making me squirm or whatever. I wasn't squirming. I'm, I'm exaggerating. It's not, it wasn't like that. They enjoyed the prospect of like pushing me like that, you know? Like they were all, they were literally laughing at me. They were literally laughing at me. And dude, they were all over 18. That's weird as fuck now that I think about it. They were all over 18. They were harassing a minor. That was um, educational. What was I saying? Oh, okay, insecure. These kids are super insecure. And this, this goes right along with it. It's like, it's super easy to read kids, dude. 13 year old, 12 year old kids will just act in extremes. Like they'll never act like a reasonable, like they'll download the personalities of like the characters on the TV shows they're watching and they'll be like very, very exaggerated. Either they're extremely shy or they're extremely outgoing. There is no in the middle, especially like 12 year olds, you know, especially for the younger ones. Dude, one thing I didn't expect was, um, actually two things I didn't expect were the very extreme like 12 year old boys who were extremely like harsh bullies and like the 12 year old girls who are like extremely clingy. And I would like think like, what did their parents do wrong? Like, are their parents not involved? Are they just neglecting them? Okay, so the bullies, right? These were the guys. Now keep in mind, when you draw a stick figure to represent a person, I wasn't too far off from that drawing. That's only a mild exaggeration, all right? And these guys, these like 12 year old, 13 year old dudes, they go around and try to like impress their friends and like impress their the, uh, the girls by like bashing me. Um, and they did this like every opportunity they got, not just for me, for like, any opportunity they could find, but I was a I was an easy target because how skinny I was, and they would try to be all like slick about it, where it seems like they're just like doing shit, and they just like happen to stumble upon me, and they just like say some nice this like right when they see me, but it's so painfully obvious, like they're planning it out, and they're like taking time to think of a clever roast, like oh okay, what am I gonna say, what am I gonna say, like dude relax, like what what business do you have, like go play with a fucking football, like stop worrying about stupid shit like this like what are you what, what, what are you gaining from this but i mean like i can't really ever just like make them stop caring right i can't ever like tell them like hey why the hell why the hell is this like a priority for you it's like a phase right they'll get over it right but what was hilarious is how obvious it was because it made me think to myself like was i this stupid when i was 12 because i know i did shit like that i know i would like fake a lot of shit like i would pretend like i was a lot more charismatic than i actually was right i would try to adopt the personalities of people that i admired unconsciously and just try to integrate that into my own personality as, as difficult and as strenuous as that might be. And even though I know I did that same shit, nobody ever pointed it out to me. None of the adults pointed it out. And I, I thought to myself, like, when I was 12, did these adults notice all along that I was just like BSing for attention and they didn't say anything? And dude, okay, wait, I gotta mention this, okay? With the girls 
maybe I was the only one who noticed this. Because, no, I couldn't have been the only one who noticed this. I see it all the time now, and nobody says anything. And this is the problem. The fact that, like, this is a taboo subject to talk about, even talking about little kids in general, like, not just, like, little girls. Like, even if you say a sentence like, oh, this kid was at the park, like, that's risky to say, especially as a dude. Like, if you're a girl, you could get away with saying a lot more shit, but, like, me, like, it's risky to even just talk about these things. And that sucks. That's, that's actually really, that's not what you want. Because what happens is when a subject becomes taboo and nobody wants to talk about it, the malicious people in who, who take advantage can get away with shit because nobody wants to stand up and say anything because even just talking about it is taboo. It's like a, a, my parents would tell me like how in India, um, if somebody like gets beat up or, or killed or something like that or robbed, nobody will call the police because the police, like they get paid if they, if they like arrest somebody, right? So if you call the police and the guy who did a hit and run has already left the scene, they'll look at you, even if you called them, if you, even if you call them there, they'll look at you and they'll be like, oh, did you do this? And they'll arrest you just so they can get their paychecks. And it's like, that's what's going on. Like, if you say, if you report something, if you go like, hey, what the hell is going on? Like in this, in this field where like kids are being exploited, you run the risk of getting in trouble just by talking about it because it's a taboo subject and it shouldn't be taboo. That's the problem is that people don't talk about this stuff. And I feel like people notice this shit too. But nobody speaks about it. When I noticed at camp, and I swear to God, bro, I couldn't have been the only one who noticed. I'm literally about to say this, and this is a risky thing to say. Like, I can't say this if I have way more followers, because people will, like, give me so much shit for this. It's like, in my mind, from what I saw, this is undisputable. Girls 100% mature faster than guys. Mentally. And some of the girls, okay, if you ever do mosaic, right? I think this is just the nature of being on the swim team. Okay, it's a nature of, it's the nature of like being a guy that's older than them, that's, that's also just so happens to be swimming with them like every day. You could be the ugliest looking, Mr. Crocker looking, stick figure looking, dry bones looking, stick bug looking, cinnamon stick from Apple Jacks looking, squirrel from Ice Age looking motherfucker alive, bro. You could legit be a two out of 10. But as long as you're three to five years older than a bunch of little girls and you're in a pool with them every day, like just by mere exposure, some of them will just like stick to your side. And it's just like, there was nothing I could have done to elicit that or stop that. It just happened by itself. And it was so fucking obvious, dude. It was the same way. It was just like the guys, like kids, 13 year old kids cannot act for shit. It makes me wonder like, how the fuck do they get kids like to be actors? It must be a real struggle to find actual good child actors, right? They have to have a really solid theory of mind. This would be really intelligent for them to actually be good actors when they're kids. Or you can just convince them that what they're in is real, like some Disney Channel type shit. But yeah, um, these girls, just like the guys, would try to be really, they would try to be all slick about it. They'd be like, oh, uh, Afu, I didn't see you there type shit, you know? But it was so, it was so obvious. Like, kids are open books. They can't act to save their lives. I even remember thinking, like, in the moment, not even when camp was done, because the majority of thoughts I had about the camp that I'm speaking about is all retrospective. But in the moment, like, while I was there in the pool, I remember thinking, like, holy shit, it would be so easy to abuse my power. Imagine if they picked the wrong person to be swim guide. Because you never know people like that, you know? You never know, like, you can never judge someone for that sort of thing. It's never the people you expect. You can never tell that sort of thing. Malicious people are always, even me, I've done a lot of fucked up shit that, like, people would never expect from me. And it, never in, like, this sort of situation, right? Imagine if they had picked somebody, not like me, who would have actually abused their power. This is what I meant when I said earlier, like, bro, for the swim team, just have all girls. And have only the safest pick to, picks of girls. You just, you're reducing the chances as much as you can. Because what they did to pick their swim guides, it was literally, like, luck of the draw. They just, like, drew straws, basically. And I even talked to Azra about this, too. I talked to Azra, like, hey... The girls are kind of like, uh, kind of, kind of clinging, you know? And she warned me this would happen too. She warned me before the camp. And then when I talked about it again with her, she said the same thing. She's like, yeah, it's going to happen. You just have to ignore it. And it's like, like, I knew that already. Like, I wasn't, I wasn't that stupid. I was a pretty stupid kid, but like, I wasn't too stupid. That was what the real struggle was, actually. It was dealing with kids. Because you think, oh, I'm swim guide. It'll be a piece of cake. It'll be so easy. Like, no, dude. There's hella shit you got to think about. And uh, it was already, I was already out here, like, dying from being in a pool this long every day. And then there's also this, like, I'm overstimulated. I'm a 16-year-old dude overstimulated because the female counselors who actually were my age were actually, like, acting really cool with me. So it was, like, bro, it was hard to stay focused. But... In the pool, bro, I was like, I was on a mission, bro. I was not gonna let these kids anywhere near me. I would straight up swim away. I was disrespectful. Like, 
And they told me like, hey, dude, like you're some guy, you can't be so mean to the kids. I was so disrespectful. Like, come up to me, they'd say what's up, and I'd swim away. And, and it's not even like, dude, this happened with every group. This is the problem. Who's raising these kids? Group one would come, and it would happen, and I'd be swimming away from, constantly from like the same like three to five girls. And they'd get out, and i get like a 20-minute break. We're showering. I'm in the hot showers. I'm relaxing, me and Juju. We stay in the hot showers way longer than we're uh, supposed to. They tell us like, okay, you got like five minutes. Nah, we stay in there way longer. We spray cold water on the participants, you know, just to screw with them. But I get the hot shower. And then once the uh, the 20 minutes is up, and then the kids would like, they'd see me in the hot shower and they'd see the shower head that I'm holding and it'd be cold water. And they'd run and get right next to me to hop in the hot shower with me. And I couldn't, I can't like push these kids out of there, especially like it's slippery floor. I'm not gonna like, you know, but I'd be like, hey, no, 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 get out. We get that 20 minutes, and then group two would show up. And we're right back at it. And I'd, I'd go through that entire thing again. And then again, and again. And it's like, also, another thing I realized was like, just swimming in general. Cause like, I, you know, you go to pools when you're a kid and it's always like, you never you never expect it to be like a workout, right? You never imagine when you when you ask your friends like, hey, bro, are you trying to go work out? Or you ask your friends like, hey, you trying to go to the pool? Like those are two very different things. If you're like serious about swimming, those kind of mean like the same thing really. Because people who, who don't go to the pool often, they might think like, oh, like being a swim guide is gonna be easy, right? Like I already mentioned like mentally it's a difficult thing, but like the swimming part itself is easy, right? No, dude. Dude, swimming for like six hours a day every fucking day and then being in the showers and all this stuff like being in the water and all this stuff and constantly having to deal with the, like the smell of old spice and chlorine in the air like dude by the end of the the week of camp i was so fucking sore dude like i'd never been that sore i'd been more sore before that but it's like everything was in pain it was it was so weird like if you want a full body workout bro go swim like i'm i'm convinced after that whole thing I'm convinced that swimming is by far the healthiest, like best all around workout you could do. Like if you could only do one workout for the rest of your life, you should, you should always swim. Because when you work out like, let's say like back, right? Let's say you got back day or like pull day. You can miss spots. Like sometimes your lats will be really sore, but your traps will be like 50% uh, worn out because traps are also heavily involved in a lot of uh, push movements, not just pull movements. And so like, it's just your lats that are just like completely torn to shreds. And sometimes, you know, your lower back will be like totally fine. Your lower back will be like nothing. And your traps will be like 50%. And, and maybe your biceps will be, you know, in absolute shambles way before any of your uh, lower back, mid back, any, before any of your back is sore or, or uh, fatigued rather. And you're getting all your hypertrophy from your biceps. But there's like, you know, mind muscle connection, things like that. But actually, I think there's actually better strategies now than mind muscle connection, which is not necessarily imagining the movement, the uh, contraction um, of your muscles, but rather the movement of uh, objects, the, the completion of tasks rather, which helps more to uh, build strength and endurance than it does to grow muscle. Like grow muscle, like it helps more, I believe, with uh, the type 2A fibers, the muscle fibers and things like that. I know low reps is, low reps, high volume is like the strategy for it. But like, if you're going for strength, you go for isometrics and you go for that sort of thing. But I don't, I don't want to talk about that right now. But um, there's there's ways when you work out to like, you have to be, if you want to be efficient about working out, you want to get everything, you have to kind of be very meticulous about it. Either you follow a, a very well put together training program or you do your own research, but you do it very, very thoroughly. That With swimming, dude, that's not the case. Like if you swim a lot, there isn't a square centimeter of your body that is not fatigued, that is not experiencing hypertrophy. Every inch of, of, of your muscle, like from the the rear delt shoulder into, which is a part that I never work out, sinking into in between my biceps and triceps, like an area that you don't even work out. You don't even think about working out these areas. And even like grip strength and stuff like that, because you got to cup your hands and stuff. All the areas that like normal uh, resistance training like normal weightlifting routines rather, because like resistance training can be, uh, is it much wider, but like just normal weightlifting routines that like a, a decent personal trainer will give you, they won't reach like a lot of different spots, but like, nah, dude, with train, with, uh, with swimming, every square centimeter of your body is sore. Like everything I did, I remember how it felt. Juju can attest to this. Like when I put on my backpack, I could like feel the, it made me acutely aware of like how the straps were like pressing into my shoulders. Like I remember, um, you know, your backpack probably has like a foam part in the middle and then it has like probably like fabric that's like stitched. And I remember feeling the stitches and the foam and like the uh, holes in the foam, like in my shoulders, like they would press into it. And I was so like, dude, what the hell is this? I never, I, I mean, you could feel it anyways, 
regardless uh, whether you swim or not, but it, I was so aware of it. Like it couldn't get out of my mind. It felt painful. Like I would try to think about other things and my mind would just go right back to the fact that like, hey, there is these like strings hanging from your backpack that are pressing into your shoulder. It, it was like, it's a different kind of sore, bro. Everything I did would, would result in something like this. Wearing shoes literally hurt my feet. It would hurt my feet to put them on. And I remember um, on the very last day, I would tell people like, hey bro, can you pull this door handle for me? Or can you open this door of peanut butter for me? Because my fingers would like burn if I did that sort of thing. It's a different kind of sore, bro, I'm telling you. So just a different kind of workout. Maybe you wouldn't experience it if you're like more athletic if you have more uh muscle mass but like in the position i was in how weak i was like never working out or anything like that for me at that level i probably experienced a soreness that like that most people could probably never experience in their lives it was it was a totally unique experience and it's not something i think i could ever replicate ever again because i'm a lot stronger now i'm not 80 pounds and six feet anymore i'm 117 pounds and six feet which is still really skinny but i'm working on it i'm working on it the reason why i think swimming is the best workout because you can't necessarily measure it in reps because even when you're you're pain, in pain even when you're fatigued you can still swim like for the most part right like you think you can, you, you never feel like you can't swim until there's a point where you really can't swim and then, then you're screwed. But if you know your limits, like you always feel fine in the pool. You always feel like if you work out and you're super sore, you can go into the pool and you feel great. What happens is like when I got out of the pool is when I felt it. When I got out of the pool, it was like if I wanted to um, lift something, right? It would feel really heavy for me. I feel really sore. But if I brought that thing with me into the pool and I lifted it, it was so easy. So it's like I can push myself way past the normal levels of fatigue with normal resistance training that people do in the gym. And that's why I feel like if you know your limits, it's a great workout because usually the pain of weightlifting is what makes you stop. It's what uh, makes you go like, all right, I'm done. I'm gonna go back home now. But there's no pain in the pool. And I feel like also in the pool, there's very low risk of injury. It's like the ultimate calisthenic. It's like, imagine if you're if you're doing um, bicep curls, right? And you're so fatigued, you can't lift your arms anymore. You're done. But swimming is the opposite. Like if you're sore from swimming, what means what that means is you can't do bicep curls when you're out of the water, but you could do it when you're in the water because of uh, the buoyancy. The buoyancy makes all the soreness go away and it makes things easier. That's why you probably can't run on the wall in real life, but you could definitely run on the wall in the water. You could jump a lot higher and stuff in the water, do flips and all that, you know? And I feel like that's how you can really push yourself to your limits without uh, putting in like, you need a lot of willpower and a lot of motivation, not just discipline. You need a lot of motivation and discipline and willpower to be able to push yourself to your limits in the gym because it's painful, deeply painful. You get hot and all that stuff. But in the water, bro, that's where you're meant to work out. Like human beings as animals, I feel like that's where we're meant to be in for long periods of our lives. I, I feel like that's the meta is going to, like everyone knows by now that like different, different, like, you know, kettlebells are plain and simple, superior to dumbbells in 60 to 70 percent of uh cases 60 to 70 percent of workouts you'd rather do them with kettlebells and dumbbells um for real world application stuff and everyone knows like you know working out legs is absolutely essential uh, it's probably the most essential workout is working out legs for like a workout routine it's the most neglected and it's, it should be the least neglected especially like glutes and stuff like that glutes and hamstrings are very neglected especially for guys guys don't work out glutes which is which they absolutely should what's it called if they want to not drag their feet and they want good posture, they should work out glutes. Everyone knows that like full sit-ups bring very diminishing returns pretty damn quickly. So like the meta of working out has like totally changed over like the past uh, like 15 years, right? Because even 15 years ago, I'd say like 20 years ago, uh, sit-ups were like, like the gold standard for uh, ab workouts. But now it's like nobody even recommends them anymore. But I feel like pretty soon, like give it 20 years from now, swimming and swimming related exercises like aerobic exercises and stuff like that will be the new meta because unlike normal workouts you can't be stopped by fatigue so if you're if you're with the right people and you're getting uh, a proper supervision and proper training and there's a lifeguards and stuff you aren't stopped by soreness you can push yourself as much as you want but you are stopped by drowning so there is a certain point where it's not like diminishing returns it's just you do so much volume that there's just a line you cross and and then you're screwed but as long as you don't cross that line and you know to not cross that line, you know where it is, which I'll admit is not the easiest thing to know. But I feel like in the future, if we develop better methods for understanding oneself and, and knowing one's limits, right, especially with a lot of research going on today, I feel like swimming will be the meta of working out. Like it'll be like if you're a bodybuilder, consider swimming before, after whatever workouts you do, because it'll never be as efficient as the, uh, you know, training programs where you could really uh, isolate muscles and things like that for bodybuilding. But even for that, 
you could probably benefit greatly from swimming, from uh, developing quite a bit more flexibility and mobility so that way you can get more range of muscles, so that way you can build more muscle mass for the future and things like that. You know, if you're playing the long game, swimming seems like the right way to go. It seems like a great thing to incorporate into your workout program. Soreness from swimming is a different kind of pain. Maybe it's just that day that I experienced that, like how people who are in weird situations have unique experiences, like people who have very, very low tolerances experience their first time being high or being drunk as a totally different thing as a, a, a people who have very high tolerances naturally. And people who have high tolerances can never actually experience those, can never actually experience those things that the people with low tolerances can experience. So it's, it's like, maybe that was just a unique, like, one-time thing. But actually, no. Being sore from working out, it's like, everyone knew this other than me. Like, when I was at the camp, like, everybody would sort of uh, hint. Like, they would say things that implied that they knew. And when I look at it in hindsight, like, they definitely knew about this stuff. Because, like, we had multiple groups every day. And I was in every single session every single day. And, like, Juju was in, like, 60% of them. And Eliza was in the pool, like... 35% of the time. Sheza was in the pool like 25% of the time, maybe maybe 20%. And like Uzra was in the pool like 5% of the time. But like that was fine for her because like she was like the lifeguard basically. So her, her main job was like telling us what to do, right? From above, from, from outside the water. It was, it's cool. But like I was, compared to everybody else, I was in 100% of the time. I was always the first to get in and the last to leave because I enjoyed it. Everybody else, like, I fucking tore my body to shreds and everybody else was really, like, careful about that. And this dude, Juju, bro, he was built. Like, he was swole as hell. And even at the end of the camp, he was telling other people that he was sore after his, like, measly 60% pool time. But, dude, this dude had no fucking idea what I was going through. It was, it was, uh, I'm glad I got to learn that. I'm just, I'm glad that that's over because I couldn't do shit for, like, the next few days. Like, I got invited to sleepovers and I'm like, nah, dude, I can't. Can't. I literally cannot. Don't swim too hard for too long. Now that I know, oh yeah, I should be aware of my limits. I should try to look for the patterns as to, you know, myself slowing down, running out of breath, being feeling exhaustion, that sort of thing. Now that I know that, I'm, 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 I'm glad. Uh, I feel like I'll be safer in the future because of it. It's just, it's a weird kind of sort. If you, if you haven't tried it before, I feel like I, I recommend going to the pool with people, uh, with lifeguards and stuff like that, and really, really pushing yourself in water that you could stand in, obviously. But like the kind of soreness that you get on like really, really tough leg days, where you actually feel like you can't move your legs anymore. It it's like that kind of soreness, but instead of just concentrated in your legs and your calves, it um it goes across your whole body. And not across, it goes deep. Like you feel it in the level of your bones. Like you can do a deep tissue massage and still feel like you can feel your well, I can feel my bones because I'm skinny enough to like feel the bones in my arms and stuff like that. But I would feel it there. I'd feel the soreness there. I never experienced anything like that before, and I don't think I'll ever experience anything like it since. But yeah, um, I also don't think it helped that uh, I got like three hours of sleep every night and I was surviving off of like peanut butter, Skittles, and Chips Ahoy. Another thing, another thing I learned, a, a pretty, a pretty important thing I would say is um, you actually want a cold pool. This is something that a lot of people don't know. I don't know anyone that I've ever talked to who actually knew this. We would talk to the people at uh, Emory and stuff like that. And like, as much as these people might complain, like the participants and stuff might complain like, oh, why can't they heat up the pool? Bro, trust me, every like camp staff, everyone in camps tries, like they try to get the heated pool. Like they try to convince the colleges or campuses or wherever they're at. They try to convince them. Like they plead, they like beg and plead like, hey, can we heat up the pool? It's, a, it's actually a struggle to do that. Like secretly behind the scenes, you don't see it. You don't see it if you're a real participant, but every camp staff actually does their best to give people hot water. But trust me, the camp staff can't explain it to one by one to each individual person. Just listen to me when I tell you this. You don't want that. You don't want uh, hot water, like warm pools, like room temperature pool. You don't want, or not room temperature, they are room temperature. You don't want pools that uh, even come close to your body heat level. Because like, it's crazy that nobody even, nobody I talk to even knows this. Like I see adults, grown adults, who like step in cold water, like, oh, let me see. And, and they, they put their, they dip their toes and they're like, oh, it's too cold, I can't go in, I can't go in. But it's like, no, you want it to be cold. Hot water, hot water is for staying still. Hot water is for the um, like cleansing, quote unquote. It's for like the, the like the pseudo womb type feeling, right? Uh, the nostalgic subconscious, nostal like unconscious nostalgia, eutrophic bath, like uh, hot spring onsen type of shit. Maybe sensory deprivation does the same thing as well. I don't know, I've never um, done sensory deprivation, but I can't imagine that they'd put you in cold water for that. 
uh, especially when you're not moving at all. It's it's for it's for the eutrophic feeling. But the problem with heated pool, like that's what hot tubs. You don't move around. You don't go swimming in hot tubs. You don't go splashing water. But the problem with heated pools is if you're moving around, you know, like swimming and stuff, which you're supposed to be doing, you'll generate so much body heat that if the pool is heated, you you run the risk of just like passing out. And and it's like they can't make the pool hot just because some people are going to be like somewhat inactive in the pool when there's a chance that at least a couple people, at least there's always going to be at least like one person who's like very active in the pool, always moving around. And they run the risk of just like drowning if the pool is too hot, like of just of, of the feeling of exhaustion, not drowning, but like not at these camps. They're not going to drown at these camps, but like here's my, here's my wisdom to all these people who from, from personal experience, here's my wisdom. Okay. Step into a cold pool, right? And if it's like too cold, oh, I don't want to go in. I don't want to go in. That's fine. Step into it. And then just go all the way in. Understand that it's cold. Jump in. Go all the way in. Get your head in, your hair, like all of it, like fully, like deep dive into it. And then once you're in the water and it's feeling cold and you're shivering and you're like, it's too cold, it's too cold, it's too cold. And you feel like getting out. Do like a flip under the water, you know? Swim around. Move, move your body. Like run on the walls and do all that stuff. Do like shadow boxing and all that, you know? Everything for like 120 seconds at least, right? 120 to like 200 seconds, I'd say. Just like go crazy under the water. Or you don't, your whole body doesn't need to be under the water, like your head and everything, but just like neck deep in the water and just like move around hella. Don't let a single part of your body stay still. And after like two minutes, two to three minutes, you won't feel cold anymore. And it, two to three minutes actually takes quite a while because it's like, that'll be the longest three minutes of your life when you're actually doing all that. Because it's a lot of moving, it's a lot of using your muscles. And uh, if you do that, you might actually feel sore afterwards because it's a different kind of sore that you'll feel from the pool versus from resistance training. But when you do that, <clears throat> from my personal experience, take on single grain of salt because I'm no scientist, but if you do that, you won't feel cold anymore. And what's crazy is even if you move to a new area with cold water, and you don't even have to be so active after that, you could like kind of chill after that. And even if you move to a new part of the pool, like 20 feet away with like brand new fresh water that you have not heated up with your own body heat, you haven't touched it your body heat and your breathing will still keep your internals warm somehow. And it'll like kind of register to your body like, hey, the rest of your skin is cold, but your skin is waterproof. It doesn't matter. The water's not going to get in. So who cares? And it'll it'll kind of like ramp up your... I don't know what it does. I don't know how that works. It worked for me. Maybe it's placebo. I don't know. But placebos have been shown to work. Even if, even when people know they're placebos, they, they're still been shown to work. If they heated Olympic pools, like if they accidentally turned on the heat, uh, cause they can, they can do that. But if some careless dude just like turns on the heat for uh, an Olympic swimming thing, the swimmers would just like, they would just like drown. Like they'd get exhausted because swimming, swimming makes you hot in more ways than one. If you're moving around, that is like, you can do nothing in a pool. You can be lazy, uh, which you shouldn't be and you won't get hot. But if you're doing what you should be in a pool, you, you'll feel it. You'll feel your body temperature, like understand the situation, understand that you're in water and, uh, uh, act accordingly. And it's like, it blows my mind. It makes me feel sad because like people who are like, they see everybody else in the pool having fun and they, they want to go in to join them, but they, they don't want to go in because it's too cold. But they're like, man, I really want to hang out with everyone. It's like, bro, you don't, you don't have to miss out on it. Go in, move around a lot. Like don't, don't worry about hanging out for like the first like two or three minutes. Just move around like hella and make like splat, like make bubbles around yourself basically. Like move around so much that you're surrounded by bubbles. And after like two, three minutes, you'll be fine. And uh, uh, you'll be excited. You'll actually like, you'll be a bit more hyper is from what I found. Like, again, take everything I'm saying with a grain of salt. Maybe consult some like Wim Hof podcast, look at some YouTube videos, whatever, uh, talk to some, or not talk, but like watch some videos on some, what some doctors have to say about this sort of thing, right? I'm pretty sure, I know, I know Joe Rogan's probably made videos on, the, uh, probably talk about this sort of thing on multiple occasions, considering how much uh, fitness related talk he's had. And I believe he's had uh, people talk about uh, Wim Hof stuff. Uh, if you want to look it up, you search WIM space, space HOF. It's this dude who like runs marathons in like Antarctica. I'm pretty sure he'll have a, he'll have a solid answer for you. I never really looked into any of this stuff. I've seen clips here and there, like motivational clips, but um, my guess would be like maybe moving around that much in the water. Your body knows when it's in the water. Your body's smart enough to know that. Maybe it triggers some sort of like nervous system response that like ramps up your systems. Maybe it like ramps up your like breathing oxygen 
your uh, digestion partitioning. I mean, maybe that's why you can't go into a pool right after you eat. Maybe that's part of the reason, not just buoyancy, because the buoyancy of a pool can't be solely responsible for the, the feeling of throwing up you get, right? Because it's not like your, your, your neck is uh, in the pool most of the time for most people, right? So it's like that can't be the only reason, especially when your uh, digestive system is, is working hard at uh, funneling all that food down uh, through, through your digestive tract. So it's like, even, even then there's got to be some kind of system in place where if you're in the water, because when you're in the water and you're um, in a hot tub, you don't feel like throwing up all that much. Nowhere near as much as you did if you were moving around hella. But then again, maybe that's just um, a reaction the same way you'd get if you ate a lot and you ran on the treadmill, you know? You're just pushing your heart rate up, basically. Oh, dude, that's probably also why... That probably also might contribute to uh, the fact that, like, you know how when you get out of the pool, you're, like, absolutely starving every time, and, like, it makes food taste so much better? Hard workouts can make you hungry, for sure, but eating after you get out of the pool, eating, like, a, a, a sandwich and Doritos and, like, Capri Sun and all that stuff, like, that sort of thing, after you get out of the pool after, like, hours of swimming with the homies on at some, like, birthday party or whatever, like, that makes food hit different, dude. Food tastes unreal after that. It's like, it's trippy, actually. Like, you're actually kind of, like, tripping in a way. I feel like, uh, you know, when, when you're high and your, your serotonin receptors are, are firing off because of a THC binding with them, I feel like in that same way, there's probably a lot of serotonin going on when you're in that social interaction in, in, a, in a pool and your body understands that it's in a pool that allows you to also get the same sort of effect with food. And I can imagine that maybe that's what it's like to taste food when you're high, is the same, then, damn, that makes being high really, like a really attractive thing. Cause food's gotta taste amazing all the time. Being able to control that effortlessly, just smoking something, all these things seem to be somewhat connected in my head. But like I said, I'm no scientist. I do know some things about this. Like these systems like digestion, digestion in particular, disproportionately to what you might think uh, relative to your other systems, Digestion generates huge amounts of body heat. And uh, I feel like that's the kind of body heat that would let you feel warm and that would keep the rest of your systems uh, safe. That would signal to your brain like, hey, you might feel cold, but you're safe. So relax on sending the uh, pain signals, you know? I feel like that's the kind of thing that would um, keep your body actually safe in the water, in very cold water, that is. But um, I'm stupid, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. Everything I'm saying is literally just a shot in the dark. I'm just brainstorming right now. But um, I learned quite a lot when I was there about like the wa water and pools and stuff like that and how these things sort of work. I learned the most about kids though, about like the way they act. The kids were cool for the most part. I'm good with kids. I'm better than anyone else I know. It's so weird because like it was against the rules to like get close to participants and become friends, like become close personal friends with participants for like obvious reasons, right? Or to, you, you couldn't give them rides and stuff like that. You know, they had specific rules about this stuff. But um, I was the only one who had friends who... Some people had, like, younger siblings. I had homies who are participants, like, on Skype and on Steam. Like, we play games together. Like, we played Brawlhalla together. A couple of the kids were participants. Like, we would ditch school together. And we'd go to Aussie Plaza or, like, the... We'd, like, ditch Kane um, and go to QT and stuff like that. I've had sleepovers with two of the participants that were there. But like we were only um the two participants, we were only two years apart. So it wasn't like a crazy big deal. Oh, and I remember um during during camp, I would literally be like talking to them, like on Skype, I'd be messaging them like, hey, I'm at sleepovers and stuff um, with these counselors, like your counselor, your group counselor is with me at the sleepover. Um, and I tell them like, I told them about the uh, streak I went on of being awake, which is crazy. Uh, I stayed awake for 65 straight hours during camp, during training. It's a personal record for me that uh, still stands to this day. I've never beaten 65 hours. I don't think I ever will either. Actually, 65 hours, what is that? That's like a little less than three, 24, 48, 72. Yeah, no, it's a little less than, it's uh, seven hours less than uh, three days. So I slept basically three days. I fell asleep legit sitting upright in a car while we were blasting uh, Travis Scott day before rodeo. We were blasting um, that song, uh, Zombies, and that's when I fell asleep. Like, it's super hype, and, like, bro, if you're, if you're tired enough, you'll fall asleep anywhere. That's why I don't think I can break the record anymore. Not because of, like, any, uh, health reasons, which is probably the real reason why I shouldn't try to break the record, but I just don't think I could break it anymore. And that's actually, like, a common, uh, theme in Mosaic that you'll find, which is, like, um, 
every camp has at least one person who will like fall asleep behind the wheel. Like every camp that happens, because I was actually going for a, I was going for seventy five hours of being awake. That was my goal. I wanted to stay awake for seventy five hours. So like, I like put my seat up all the way. Um, I made sure to uh, blast like hot air because you know cold air makes me fall asleep. Um, and I made sure to only put on like the hardest songs, like uh, like hard in the paint. Um, French Montana, Ocho Cinco, ASAP Ferg Work, uh, Future Karate Chop, uh, Keith Ape Ichima, uh, Chief Keith Love Sosa, um, and Travis Scott Zombies, that was the one I was playing, and like a few others, like just consecutively, like all of the hardest songs, like songs that would make you like go crazy in the gym. Like these are all songs that you you put in a in a workout uh, playlist. Like if you with the sh- if you're really with the shit, you know, not these like up tempo like bullshit songs they put in a like playlist. Like like the kind of stuff that these people put in these playlists. I imagine like I look at that and I imagine some like CrossFit like cardio dude who's like fat and like unhealthy and he's like I'm gonna hop on this cycling machine and he's got like the giant headband and like wristbands and all that stuff for, like sweat for like sweat. It's like totally unnecessary. For what they're doing, and it's like, that's what I imagine when I look at all these workout playlists. But if you want a real, like, legit workout playlist that'll make you go hard for actual resistance training uh, to really push yourself, these are the kind of songs you put in there. Like, just songs that just trap songs that are like that are actually hard that make you stay awake, that make you like get hype when you're about to fall asleep. Those are the best songs, in my opinion, for that sort of thing. I should make a workout playlist. One day I'll make one and I'll put it in the description of this video and I'll, I'll share it with you guys. So, um. The whole theme with Mosaic is magic, all right? I went to Camp Mosaic as a participant. I still remember, like, nothing was labeled, and uh, everything had, like, um, drawn magic labels, right? And they would they would reiterate it so much. It was, like, all this, like, uh, stuff that they did with markers. They would constantly say over and over and over again, like, everything is magic, right? Like, the theme song of Mosaic when I was a participant was, like, the song that's, like, uh, it's so magical, you and me, la di da like, that song. And I started to actually have doubts at a certain point. I was like 99% sure that the magic juice they gave us was just Kool-Aid because it tasted like Kool-Aid, but I was not 100% sure. And I, I'm, I'm pretty sure the other kids felt the same way too, if they had any imagination that is. This is when I was a participant, is what I'm saying. So naturally, uh, when I was a guide, I told everyone, all the participants, the formula for magic juice. I forgot exactly what it was. It's like they mix it in a giant barrel. They, they use like... um. Uh, like a boat or or paddle or something to mix it, which I stole from there and I still have it. They take like a commercial size like Gatorade powder and like Kool-Aid powder and stuff. And they have like special ratios of like certain flavors. I think they dump some sugar in there too as well. I didn't even know you could buy them like that. But I mean, hey, I guess you can. I mean, it makes sense now that I think about it. Like how else would all these like summer camps, you know, sports teams, you go to like soccer camp or whatever. How else would all the, all of them have like so much Gatorade? They're not out here like pouring just buying a bunch of bottles and just pouring it. How would these like football teams take these like giant containers of Gatorade and like uh, pour it on their coaches and stuff, you know? It makes sense why they would, ha- how they would have the commercial size Gatorade powder, you know? But yeah, I forgot the ratios exactly of what it was. It was like a mix between a few different things, but I, I watched them do it. I helped out with it a bit. I helped mix the boat or, and then um, like during lunch, I like stood up and made an announcement and just like told everyone. And the LPT dude, they got so mad at me for that shit. And rightfully so, like, I didn't take the camp all that seriously and I knew the kids were gonna tell other kids, which they did, they did. Like people came up to me in Kane later on and they were like, hey, uh, thanks for telling us about the magic juice and what it was and all that stuff. Thanks for telling us that um, uh, the magic spray was just Old Spice. Uh, and and um, I even kept the Old Spice too. But uh, I threw it away after like a week because I was like, damn, this is going to get bad. I was like, damn, I might, I might keep this because of memories. Because it still had the old, spi- it still had the magic spray um, uh, thing wrapped around it, like the paper. Uh, and I, I literally, during camp, I just ripped the paper off and just showed them what it was. And you could tell because there was still orange and blue on it. You could still see like the old spice colors thing. So it's like, I mean, they're kids. It's not like they, they wouldn't know. But yeah, I, I, I really, I was a musty corbacha. Bro. I took that. I took that camp into my own hands. I remember um, people would see me go to the uh, storage room to get snacks, and one time they told the LPTs about it. Like the other uh, counselors would like snitch, and they'd be like, oh, uh, he's going to take his break now, watch. And then they caught me take a snack from the storage room. And I told them like, um, yeah, I told the kids that uh, they should, they, if they did a swimming race, I told like three of the boys who were like the fastest swimmers, like if they do a race, the winner gets fruit gummies. 
And so they raced. And you're not allowed to do any stuff. Like, you're not allowed to do, uh, you're not allowed to take the camp in your own hands like this, especially as a guy. You, you can't do that kind of thing. You can't, it is, despite all the stuff I'm saying right now, like the stuff that I did, you got to understand that like, I'm like, people tell me in person, like I act like Balin Levine. I act like Gideon. I act like I, there's no consequences to the things that I do, you know? I, I act like a person who would just go up to somebody and say some shit that would get me punched or get me arrested. And, and people tell me that even without me recording anything. You gotta understand that about me, okay? So even though I'm wording it all like I'm, I'm making the camp seem like it's a certain way, it is a very strict camp. And that's actually the reason why I'm telling this story. It's because my experience was such an anomaly. It usually is super strict. So even though the stuff may sound normal, you're really not allowed to do any of this shit. They, they, they chewed me out actually when I got to the room chewed me out like those gummy snacks got chewed out by those kids. But, um, cause I got to them one way or another, bro. I was, I'm a man of my word. I got in trouble for, for going to the snack room, first of all. And then, um, I got in trouble for giving them the snacks later on, uh, when I wasn't supposed to give them. And then they come up to me later, like the next day and they're like, Hey, you can't even make kids race in the pool. Cause the guides are not allowed to determine activities. The guides are just there just to help out the counselors and do what they say, basically. Um, the counselors determined the activity, so I, I wasn't even allowed to tell them to race. But I wanted to make them have fun because the counselors were not going to make them have fun, and they didn't. So I did. I, I took it in my own hands. I told them I'd give them gummy snacks, and I was a man of my word. And that's not something I had when I, when I was a participant. I wanted to give them that experience. When I was a participant, it was a lot more strict. And if I had a cool counselor like that who did something like that for me, and I got gummy snacks when I wasn't supposed to, I would have remembered it. I would have remembered that. I would be really appreciative of that person. I'd really admire them. And, and I saw that and I'm like, I want to be that person. I want to be that person for those kids that I never got to experience. So, uh, yeah, and they did remember me. I had people in Connect come to me even like two years later. Like, hey, uh, remember you showed us what, uh, you ripped off the paper off the magic spray and you showed us it was just Old Spice or whatever? Yeah, it was, uh, they remembered. They remembered. I hardly remembered anything from, from camp. I only remember a few very, very memorable moments, but they remembered. It was actually really cool. Maybe I shouldn't have done the uh, Old Spice one because like the magic spray, it was really cool. Um, I remember it smelling better when I thought it was magic spray. Like when I was convinced, oh, this actually is magic spray when I was like 11 or whatever. Um, Cause different, there's like different camp mosaic. Like there's a lot of different, you can go at many different ages. You can go, you can probably go when you're like eight. I remember um, at first I thought like, this is not magic spray. But once I thought it was magic spray, it smelled way better. And as we would leave the locker rooms, they would spray us down with it. Um, and we had to do the same thing when I was the guide. I was the guide. I was, I was actually the person who was in charge of it. Like I would keep it in my locker and I would spray all the kids down every time they left. And there was a second bottle just in case we ran out, but we never needed to use it because I wasn't going crazy with it, you know? Oh, there was this, um, there was this day where we had a debrief at the pool. We usually have our debriefs, um, in that room that I showed earlier, but, uh, one day we had a debrief at the pool. So all the, uh, counselors and guides were like, we all went to the deep end, the part where we're not allowed to take the participants. We went to like the um, six feet, six, uh, not 16 feet deep part of the pool. And when we all went back to like the showers, we all had like a fucking mosh pit, dude. Like we fucking took the shower heads off and like started spraying them around and shit. Like the littest mosh pits are actually in the showers when you think about it. Same thing happened at Aluma, which I'll talk about next. But I swear, dude, the best mosh pits to ever happen, happen in showers. And like the best moments of all, like from camp, uh, were those like late night at random people's houses uh, where everything is like gut bustingly hilarious. Everything is like either super funny or super personal, like deep conversation where people would just say stuff that like, stuff that I shouldn't even talk about, you know? Those were the actual, like the funniest moment of, of the entire training was that moment of, uh, 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 they forgot to mention Shaza and Eliza, but the funniest moment of camp was probably when um, it was like the morning time and we were out at a, we were out at like Sweet Hut or Moogles or some, some place like that. We're walking and we look back at this dude, this dude's car and he has like a giant dent on the side of his car across the whole thing, across the passenger side. And it had been there this whole time. It had been there for like days. And we, we thought he, all, he knew by now. And he looks at it from a distance and he goes like, what the fuck? Since when was that dent on my car? This dude didn't even notice that. And it was like, the way he said it was like, the way he looked back and just said that with like the most like, concerned voice imaginable. It was so funny, bro. We all started dying laughing. I can't do these moments justice when I'm just saying them. Like you have to be there, you know? Actually, that wasn't the funny. The funniest moment was um 
oh, this one I really can't do justice. I'm not even going to bother. Like, it was, um, we saw those, like, 50 or so, like, a smiley wristband gut pataga things at, like, Azam's house at, like, 2 a.m. And it was confusing to see them all there. I don't want to, like, go into detail as to, like, what, like, the joke even was. Because it's, like, it'll take way too much context. Like, context about Ismailis and stuff like that for you guys to even realize why it's so funny. But, dude, we were laughing so hard on that. We we probably woke people up with how much people were, with how much we were laughing on that one. I should write bullet points. I'll write bullet points when I get to the Aluma one. But I'm in the mindset right now of when I was in camp. So it's, I don't think I'm, I'll need bullet points. I'm, I'm, I'm like firing off all the neurons around that area. So there was this really interesting thing that happened, which was, um, I don't know if this ever happened before with Mosaic or since, but I left like such a huge impression on the camp and on the, like the participants. And I'm, I'm just good with kids. Like there's no other way to describe it. What, what happens is like usually at the end of camp, um, everyone will bring gifts for like the group counselors that they're a part of. Like the participants of group one will bring gifts for the counselors of group one. And then they'll also bring gifts for like other people in the group. And it's very rare for someone to bring gifts, like the participants I'm speaking about. It's very rare for one of them to bring uh, something for somebody outside of their own group. And now keep in mind, I was like one of the elective guides. And because I was on the bottom floor, the swim team saw the participants the least out of everyone else. So chances that I was going to get any gifts were really low. But by the end of it, in my backpack, I had a stack of sticky notes of Hong Kongs, uh, you know, M&M packets, gummy bears, um, like four jars of peanut butter that I stole, which that doesn't really count because I took them. Um, pretty much everything else was a gift other than that. Like king size Reese's, king size Kit Kat, Dum Dum lollipops, so many gifts, bro. I don't even do so much shit. Like I got like almond joy. I got a couple of gift cards. Um, I got a pop socket from one of the counselors, which was not from the participants. Uh, like a whole pack of like different kinds of packs of Skittles, uh, each with like different flavors. Participants would literally like their their thought process would literally be like, I'm gonna bring candy for everyone in my group, my group counselor. And Afu. And that, that's like what they were, like, that's what they did, basically. Not even any of the other people on the swim team got any of the stuff that I got. Not the logistics people, not the soccer people, none of them. Not even the, the group guides who were with the groups the majority of the time. Just me. I do mean to brag. This is me bragging. I had more gifts than, like, anybody, any other human being in that room. I had more gifts than all of them. Even the counters who were actually supposed to get gifts. I had more gifts than them. And I wasn't even a counselor. I was a guide. This is never supposed to happen. But really, I wasn't even a guide either. I was always for the participants, bro. I was a participant with the privileges of a counselor. There was no guide in anything I had going on. By the end of it, on the last day, uh, where the counselors and the participants were like signing each other's t-shirts, like they gave us mosaic shirts and they told everyone, okay, sign each other's mosaic shirts. But that's not the ones that like they were wearing. Like sometimes they put them on and they told people to sign it. But they gave us these shirts as like extras. But the kids, the participants, instead of signing the mosaic shirt, they started signing the shirt that I was actually wearing. Like they, they were like running at me with their Sharpies, trying to like put marks on my actual shirt. My shirt by the beginning of the day was empty. It was like a, it was like a cream color, like off white kind of whatever. But like by the end of these kids chasing me around with Sharpies, and I, I enjoy that. Like I enjoy, cause they know I'm not like, like a little, like I can handle that sort of thing. You know, I like the games. I like the games. I like to play games. Um, I'm not going to take everything so seriously. I'm not going to go, no, my shirt. It's, it's too risky to do that to other counselors who might take it seriously. They, they probably get yelled at, but the participants knew like I was cool with it. But bro, by the end of it, there were so many Sharpie marks on my shirt that it started to look like the actual design. It was like cookies and cream colored when it was in the beginning, it was just like an off-white. And I got in trouble with that too. I was just getting in trouble left and right. It was like, um, I, uh, at one point I let one of the participants, one of the older ones, he was like uh, 13, 14 or something like that. And I let him uh, write the word fuck on my shirt. And it's like, first of all, none of us are allowed to cuss at this camp, not the participants, guides, or counselors. So, um, but he wasn't technically saying it. Dude, I was just a participant. I don't know why they let me do all this stuff. I don't know why they gave me a shirt for the participants to sign and all that. Like, I was literally basically just a participant, the way I was behaving. Like, fuck it, bro. Let them do whatever they want. Give give some freedom to the kids to let them have some fun, you know? So I let them, 
I let, like, after him, he sort of inspired other people. I let the other participants also write cuss words on my shirt. It wasn't just the LPT that was mad. Even the counselors were fed up. Because, like, they had to deal with that shit, too. It was like, um... Because, like, I don't wear that shirt. There's cuss words all over it. I'm not going to go around indecent. It's like, you know, in public, kids will see it and all that, you know? You bother these counselors because a kid would write something on my shirt, and then he'd be like, oh, this is totally acceptable. And then he'd go write something on their shirt. And that would screw up their ability to uh, go out in public with, like, they would have to basically scratch it out, and at that point, it would be like a tainted shirt. So I get where they're coming from, because they wanted their shirts to only contain pure signatures or nice messages or whatever, right? Like, legit, um, five minutes after this dude uh, wrote fuck on my shirt, like, three other counselors came up to me, like, group counselors, and they are like, um, Ofu, did you let him write a cuss word on your shirt? And I'd go, yeah, he was pretty happy about it. And they'd go like, yeah, no, he's ecstatic, yes, 100%. Um, but now, without me noticing, I look at the back of my t-shirt and there's 15 cuss words on there. And that, like, being me, I was like cracking up, you know? Because, like, I was a participant. And that was hilarious. And it still is hilarious. But yeah, oh, dude, wait, wait, I have, I have pictures, I have pictures. I don't know if I have pictures of this shirt, but... Look at this. Tafu Bai for breaking out of his shell, bro. I hate this phrase now. I hear it so, so much. It's like, it's Smiley's, like, favorite phrase. It's just Hong Kong Tough Rouse. Hong Kong Tafu Bai for the cool new mosaic song you made. I don't know who that is. I can't read that. But I did, I do recall making a few mosaic songs. Which, like, the songs are like the whole, it's like, that's like the whole peel of mosaic. That's like the tradition. And I did make a few. I changed the meta, bro. Hong Kong to yeah, I didn't know nobody's name. Oh, there's two in there. Ah, whatever. Probably don't remember, but I did know you when you were younger. Yeah, I did remember. Oh, no, I didn't. Wait, this is... It's been great to see you going up... Anusha? Or... That's Anusha, right? Yeah, Anusha. That's weird. I don't know if that's the same Anusha, but... Hong Kong to Afraz for being funny, smart. He is the full package. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. You're... I have... I, I, I saw the... I saw... I see a picture. It says... Okay, look. Hong Kong to... Uh, your loving, genuine personality. Head over heels for obsessed counselor. Yeah, these are trolls, bro. There were so many of them. Can't wait to swim with you. Dude, look at this. Yeah, ridiculous. I was breaking records, man. Oh, look at this. Look at this. Oh, here's some of this. But yeah, that's basically how it was on the last day. I was really, I really resonated with the participants, bro. I was a participant. Let's not kid ourselves. They never should have let me in that camp to begin with if they were going for what they were going for. Like, I enjoyed myself in that camp, but it wasn't over. And they just didn't know, like, the kind of person that I was. So, like, they didn't know the kind of, the kind of behavior that I could inspire. Because I don't do these things, but I inspire this kind of behavior, for sure. And I'll, I'll take responsibility for that. But, um, the day after camp ended, Sami came to pick me up, or maybe it was Juju or something. No, 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 it wasn't the day after. It was like a couple of days after. At this point, I had already left the group chat because I'm not interested in, in talking with people that I'm not playing the same games as. If we're done playing the same games, if we're done seeing each other on a regular basis, if we're done like like being in very close proximity to each other, I don't feel the need to talk to you anymore. I don't like consider you close unless we're like literally physically in close proximity. And all these people, listen, I'm just ahead of the curve. All these people are like, no, 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 you can't do that. We're still friends and all stuff. And, and they'll see it differently. Watch, a year will go by and all these group chats die. You go into that Mosaic group chat now, nobody's talked in years. You go into the Illuma group chat now, nobody's talked in years. They're just slow is all they are. They're just behind the curve. They just don't realize, oh yeah, you do need close physical proximity to someone. I'll, I'll literally put a link to the uh, SLC that I did in the description uh, where I talked about this, where it's like, Technology makes people think that they can be close if they're far away. That's the biggest lie technology has ever told. Yeah, watch that video to, to, to know what I'm talking about before continuing. I already left the group chat and uh, these guys came to pick me up. These guys wanted to like hang out a bit one last time before my school started. No, my school had already started. I, I had a day where before school started. It was like Anam's party or whatever. I didn't show up to that. I didn't feel like it. Um, I was kind of tired and like I had shit to do. Keep in mind, this whole time, like, I have a life outside of being an Ismaili. So I'm like, no, nah, I'm, 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 not, I'm not interested in, in participating any further. My work here is done, you know? I, I came in with a purpose, my work here is done. So then I, I didn't show up to that. And then, and then the guys who came to pick me up, these were the guys who were a lot cooler with me. It wasn't just like uh, everybody showing up for like one final uh, get together with all the participants and counselors. It was like, um, this was just 
like only a handful of people. It was primarily the people who I would get rides with, I would stay at their houses, we'd show up late to uh, training every time. Like, this was that crew. And so I'm like, all right, you know what? Whatever. I'll hang out with them, you know? Because a couple of these people I was hanging out with before uh, Mosaic, and a couple of them I still hung out with after Mosaic. So this is not like, this is still people I'm close in pl- pl- close proximity with. So I was cool with it. We leave and uh, we go like, I screw it. Let's roast everyone in the group chat and leave. And this kind of, when I think about it now, this kind of left everyone everyone else in Mosaic with the, long, with the wrong impression. But like, I think it's kind of cool. Like I had a dream about this a few nights ago where it's like just the feeling of what it's like of like sending people off on their journey when you know more than them where it's like you know things that they don't know and and they're gonna learn things along the way and it's like to see that i don't know i feel like some like gandalf type like it's interesting to to see when somebody else has a misconception that you could very easily fix and clear up but you go like you know what i'm gonna leave it because it's not causing any harm i want to see what perspective comes out of this and it's like a science experiment because like that, this is always the case. Everybody has misconceptions about everything. Um, miscommunication is communication. You'll never be able to fully translate everything that happens in your mind to somebody else. Uh, like 100% data. It's never going to happen. You just do your best. Data transfer is very low speed and very inaccurate as it is right now. And I think that's good. I don't. I, I think what Elon Musk is trying to do with Neuralink trying to connect people with very high data, uh, very high efficiency communication, I think that's wrong, like morally. I think that that strips away what makes us human. And anybody who's watched Evangelion knows what I'm talking about. It's miscommunication that makes us who we are. Um, And when you get rid of that, we're nothing but robots. So I'm looking at the situation and I'm like, uh, right now in hindsight, I'm like, I could fix this right now or I could leave it. And I just like to observe it. Like I know the truth and it's not even that like, oh, I feel like I know more than everybody else, but it's just like knowing that we're all foolish and we all have these misconceptions. And you know what? I probably have misconceptions about what they're thinking about and what happened with them. But like, it's okay that we don't feel the need to constantly correct each other all the time. It's not like there's going to be any consequences of it. And if there is, those consequences are supposed to happen. That's, that's life. And besides the consequences of this sort of thing are very, very small. They'll never see me again. And they haven't. It's been since 2016, right now it's 2022. They have not seen me again since Mosaic, like any of them, except for like people I knew beforehand. So I'm in the car and we, we ride out and we go to uh, Chipotle and we start uh, roasting them. Like me and the dude in the passenger seat, we start roasting everybody in the group chat one by one. And we use like the honk, we're like, oh, Hong Kong to this dude for doing this dumbass shit. Hong Kong to this girl for um, embarrassing herself here. I start going off, dude. And we park and I hear someone outside the car go like, yo, uh, who's flaming on everyone in the group chat? And then I look out, I look out to my left and I see people there and they go like, hey, yo, he's right here. And they all start cracking up and, and we get out, we're at Chipotle, we get food. And I'm like, I have my phone and I'm going through like, it's pretty lighthearted at first, you know? But like people take an opportunity, like nothing interesting happens anymore. Even when you say something lighthearted, everyone's like, oh, crazy. There was like 10 people there. So it was a nice, like, it was it was hype, but it was also very intimate. It was a very intimate environment. It was like Sami, uh, Rhea Merchant, um, Juju, the other Janaid, uh, Shion. I can't remember. There was, a, there was a couple more people. Actually, when I think about it, that was actually um, the original crew who figured out that Ariba was the rat. This was the crew who um, took me to Chipotle, who picked me up and took me. And like... A thing you gotta know about me is like, I don't do half measures, all right? I don't play that shit. I already know I'm gonna leave the group chat. I had left a rejoin, because that's how, um, the way that group me group chats work is like, if you leave the group chat, you can rejoin yourself at any moment, if you voluntarily leave. But if somebody kicks you out, you can't rejoin. But other people in the group chat can add you back in, and then you can leave, and you can rejoin again. So it's a very sneaky strategy. It's like, oh, uh, you got kicked out? Don't worry, everyone's asleep right now. I'll add you back in, they add them, and then that person who got added back in, they leave themselves. That way, whenever they decide, they can join again. I think GroupMe is aware of the strategy. They just don't do anything about it because of the drama that ensues because of it. And it's like, this is essential drama, bro. This is cool. I'm glad that Group GroupMe is like, they have these features. And I'm pretty positive they're aware that this kind of stuff happens. But yeah, if, if I'm operating on the realm 
of stepping on people's toes, I might as well go all out and, and stomp on their feet, you know? I don't do half measures. So we all start getting involved. And I remember um, Uzra even, and like the other like goody goodies were like kicking me out repeatedly. But then the other people at Chipotle, and even a couple other people who weren't there, they were like tag teaming me back into the group. And um, it's actually really funny if you know how GroupMe works, if you've ever used GroupMe. This is kind of like the way we're using it, this is supposed to be a wholesome feature. and we're like really exploiting it. I think group me's features actually backfired in this in this one particular case. Cause I don't think they meant for it to be used like this. Cause this is like, this is how you harass a group chat. And it's like, you could probably get like 20 of your friends in there and for them to all very quickly tag team each other back. And as long as you have strength in numbers, you could annihilate a group chat. That's like a totally wholesome thing. And you could just tear it to shreds. I'm pretty sure group me had like a surge in traffic that day, dude. So they all go like, everybody with me at Chipotle is like, oh, like, let me say stuff, let me say stuff. And the thing is like, they're not like me. They, um, they don't want to seemingly burn bridges uh, and say some shit on their own account. But like, for me, I'll say shit, but I don't consider it burning bridges. Like, I'm not the kind of person, like I'm, words are words. To me, words mean very little. Actions mean everything. That's why I'm so against censorship because it's like, bro, what if there are people that are okay with it? What if there are people that are okay with having a dislike button on their videos? Like, can I opt into it? Minecraft recently did a thing um, where they instituted on Java edition, like a couple days ago, they instituted a way for, you could re you could report people's chats, uh, like speech and stuff like that. And like a human moderated team will terminate their account, or whatever. It's like, bro, I paid for the game. And for me, it's like, I wanna go into these anarchy servers and I don't get, like, I want people to experience that sort of thing. I want, I like that sort of environment. Censorship is like telling, a man he can't have a steak because a baby can't chew it well yeah they can't chew it but i'm the man in the situation let me eat my steak i like to give other people the benefit of the doubt and i like to consider them smart enough people and strong enough people mentally strong enough people to realize that words actually do mean very little in the grand scheme of things so words should never be enough to burn bridges to me none of these bridges are ever burned with words but to these other people like they're not like me so they know that they can burn bridges with words and they don't want to do that and so they start like passing around my phone I'm like i don't care i i honestly don't mind any combination of words that comes out of my mouth to anyone it's just where, like in my opinion, some people say I'm socially inept. I think I have my priorities right by judging someone's actions rather than their words. And I, I feel like if somebody else does the same for me, they'll realize, oh, my words are meaningless. I just say whatever. I don't care about what I say. My actions are, are meticulously crafted. They're well thought out. I think about them deeply and thoroughly and I have conversations about it with people. And they're not able to go into nearly the level of depth that I've gone into when arguing with me about it because I've thought about it so much. They have to really think about it beforehand, but people don't really do that. They're so focused on words rather than actions. Um, it's very rare that I find somebody who actually assesses my actions rather than my words. And when that person comes along, then I know I could really be friends with them. So I don't mind like just saying random shit, pissing people off, because that's my filter. That's my way of going, oh, you're not on my wavelength. You're not on my level. Like you, you have the wrong priorities. And if you're gonna dislike me because of it, hey, works for me, that saves me time. So um, at a certain point, my phone dies and uh, they all start logging into my GroupMe account. And there's like three different phones here logged into my account and they're all saying shit. They're all like passing each other's phones around. I'm like chiming in here and there. And I have uh, my case. My case is actually uh, at the time it doubled as a speaker and as a portable charger. So I'm charging my phone. It takes a while for iPhones to come back alive, right? So my phone comes back on at a certain point. And then um, the majority of stuff I'm saying is sort of like inside memes, but at one point I go all out and I like kick the hornet's nest. And to me, this isn't any different. Like I don't see what I said as any different from anything else, but everybody else saw this as crossing the line. And I go like Hong Kong to Ariba for being the rat of the group chat and ratting us all out to the LPTs every time we had a sleepover. And every message that I had before that, everybody was liking those messages. Like I was getting like 10 to 20 likes immediately after I sent the message. I was like, I tell you bro, I was out here breaking records. And then um, nobody liked that message. And everyone was like, oh, I wanna, I wanna hit the like button on it, but I'm scared that they're gonna hate me too. That's literally what they said. It's an admittance. They knew that I was gonna get hate for it. They, they were fine with me getting hated. And I know how considerate of them, but no, actually like, I think it's cause they knew I don't mind. Like I don't mind letting them use me as a, as an, uh, a, a catalyst or, or a bridge to, to roast people without any boundaries, right? Because it's not something they get to usually do. Like, they, they, that's not something that uh, that's socially acceptable. I don't care what's socially acceptable. So 
using me to do that, it's like, um, I really don't mind. In fact, I'm happy to do it. It's something that they only get to experience a few times in their life, and I'm happy to be the bridge, be the, the vessel for them to do it. I actually took a picture. Wait, I took a picture right before my phone died. For the second time, my phone died while I was there, and um, this is it. This is the only remaining remnants of that night. This is Summy. He was sitting to the right of me. There was like a table right here. There's people sitting next to him on the other side, left of me right here. This is Chipotle. It was pretty close to my house. And um, damn, I forgot who else was there. But yeah, this is the only remaining picture of that night. This is actually kind of an iconic picture. The one picture that can clear up the misconceptions. The one and only piece of evidence. And I just deleted it. <laughs> I mean, it'll, I'll, I'll upload this. So it's like, it'll stay alive. But the original photo, the original full resolution well, it compressed, but uncompressed as it was photo outside of a video compression. The only one remaining just got deleted. But yeah, um, like everyone stopped messaging because people, other people were also messaging at the same time. Like it was a super active, like everybody was going crazy. And then everyone stopped and nobody said a word in the group chat. Like the silence was palpable. And then like a couple minutes go by and we're, we're chilling. I'm eating my food and we're just talking and um, Ariba messages in the group chat. She hops in. And she says some shit like, it's hard to remember. She goes like, I'm literally crying right now. Like literal tears are streaming down my face right now. I try so hard and I tried to make friends with all you guys. I do gymnastics because that's totally related. I don't know why she said that. I don't know why she had to bring up that fact. You know, oh, and you know, uh, they ask you how you are and you just have to say you're fine when really you're not fine. You just can't get into it. And she was going on and on and on. She wrote like a novel, dude. Like, I think at some point she was like, uh, play me a sad song on the world's smallest violin. I don't know, something like that. But um, then I left the chat. Uh, no, I, wait, I left the chat before that. I left the chat immediately afterwards and then people on their phones showed me what Ariba said. And then people were messaging me, asking me like, hey bro, are you good? Are you okay and stuff? And see like, from their perspective, it probably looks like I had a mental breakdown. Cause, but then again, I don't know how they would not assume, cause it was literally one message was being sent like every two seconds. I don't know how they didn't see the fact that like I was messaging at like a rate that uh, stenographers type at. Also the fact that like there was like 20 people <clears throat> tag teaming me back into the group chat every time I would get kicked out. I don't know how they didn't pick up the pieces and go, oh wait, something else is going on here. But from their perspective, like from surface level, um, it seemed like I was just like losing my mind probably, uh, typing at an insane speed. But, you know, from my perspective and from the perspective of the people who were there with me at Chipotle, I was just dicking around. And uh, I guess not with that last post, because even the last post, they were like, nah, that's over the line. But I don't consider that last post about Ariba to be anything different than what I said earlier. It's still poking fun at a uncomfortable truth that you know to be at the heart of, of someone's character. That's what it, it is. It's, it's, it's a type of humor. It's a type of joke. And everyone appreciates that sort of thing. But they're like, nah. It's overboard. I'm like, this is the same thing. They, this person just so happened to have something a bit more um, damning about them revealed when the joke was stated, but it's still the same kind of joke. But um, remember I mentioned um, Ashish, that dude, the dude who flaked on me multiple times, indecisive, not a man of his word. Look at, look at what he texted me when this is all over. Ashish, I, I, I deleted his number. I delete contacts that I'm not in contact with. I only keep about like 50 to 70 contacts on my phone at any given moment. Um, and if you're not, if I'm not talking to you on a regular basis, I delete your contact. So even people that I talk to like once every couple months, I don't have your contact. Um, which means everybody from Mosaic, even like Sami and them, I don't have their contacts. Cause it's like, if they message me, um, I'll just ask who is this. And if they really like fuck with me, they'll tell me who it is. Or I could just ask somebody, hey, whose number is this? Oh, I thought you were doing so well on camp. I don't know why you're trying to cause so many issues. Trust me, you're messing with the wrong people right now. What? What are you trying to say? You do not mess with my family. This is how I imagine it being in his head. You do not mess with my family. If you don't want to be a part of it, then don't. Stay out of it. But do not bully other people. I do not like bullies. I am a, a part of the Bully Hunter organization. Grow a pair and learn to... Oh, I might have added that in there. Grow a pair and learn to respect the people who helped you out. You messed up big time. Really? I don't, I don't see any consequences of what happened. Misconceptions, for sure, but that's always the case. And you're foolish to think that that's not been the case for every word that has ever been said to anybody ever. You are part of a family who accepted you and cared for you, and you screwed it up for yourself. I feel bad for you, bro. It's fine. Blah, 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 blah. It blows my mind. There's actually a quote, and I did mention it earlier, I think, 
But there's a quote that describes it perfectly. There's two quotes, actually. This is my quote, which is, almost nothing in life should ever be taken seriously. That's mine. And then there's a quote that describes it even better. It's the people a lot smarter than me in the world who actually come up with quotes. I found this quote later, and it was, um, man suffers because he takes seriously that which the gods made for fun. And I'm like, damn, that's so true. Don't take it so seriously. We're having some fun. We're having a little bit of fun. You taking it seriously is only causing yourself to suffer. And, and he's like, oh, it's my family, my family, bro. Vin Diesel, my family. How much you want to bet he hasn't talked to anyone in that camp in like five years? Family, my ass. And even though I, I don't burn bridges with people, I can see how the thing with Ariba is kind of like, like from, from their end, from Ariba's perspective, it can be viewed as that sort of thing, right? But the thing is, is like, I kind of lucked out with that one because the weak, quiet, meek, uh, insecure, um, not insecure, but like, concerned with her appearance, concerned with her uh, 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 person, image of her personality as to be like uh, uh, not so childish or whatever. Like that kind of stereotypical girl you see in anime. Ariba was not that. Like I'm always open to, if there's ever a br uh, bridge burned on any end, it is on the other end, not on my end. I'm always down to talk to, with, to anyone in the world about anything, no matter the situation. I even, like, I made it clear earlier in this video, I don't mind talking about taboo subjects. If there's ever a thing that anybody wants to talk to me about, no matter how taboo or weird or who they are or what I might think of them, I'm always down. If you can get in contact with me, then I'm down to talk about it if I got the time. I will never ever turn somebody away from a conversation because of a because of what I think of that person or because of the subject matter of the conversation or whatever, you know? And Ariba is like, despite how much she changed, she still had a tiny bit of that like old classic Ariba in her, you know? That's who she is. That's her nature. That like the bold, the like not afraid to say what's on her mind, not afraid to poke fun and stuff. And it's like if she wasn't, if she would, if she stayed like that, throughout her entire uh, childhood, she would have gone through enough drama and experiences like I had to understand the, the moral dilemma with snitching, even when it's telling people very close to you stuff that they really, really want to know. But she would have understood that like, that is, that's betrayal. That's betrayal of someone's trust. By doing so, it's like, it reminds me of that scene in Molly's game where Molly tells the lawyer like, so you're, you're attempting to establish a rapport of trust and confidentiality with me by betraying the trust and confidentiality of your old clients by giving me dirt on them so that I can use it against you if you leak anything I say. And um, it's like that same sort of mentality. How can anybody be friends with you if they know, oh, she could just as easily betray me as well? Maybe not just as easily, but she could betray me as well. She would throw me under the bus for her own personal gain. When you've established that for even one person, for even a person that you don't like, none of your, your actual friends aren't going to want to be your actual friends. They're going to be pretending. They're going to be faking it. They're basically going to be like hiding stuff from you. They're going to have a fake friendship with you. It's going to be a half measure. And I don't do half measures. For your own personal gain, if you were smart about it, for your own personal gain, you would not betray anyone. You would not establish that you are the kind of person who would do that sort of thing. Because then nobody's going to fully trust you anymore. Nobody will ever be 100% vulnerable with you anymore. Nobody will ever give you that ammo on them. Even closest friends will hold back when saying things against you, consciously or unconsciously. They're gonna hold back. So if you truly wanna live your best life, you shouldn't betray anyone. But I think it's because she changed her personality so much, she forced it so much, that she got left out of all of these essential, the essential pieces of socialization that happen when you're a kid, when you're experiencing life, when it's not meant to be taken seriously, that teaches you these lessons, these, these formative lessons that she didn't get to learn because she was so meek and so, ah, oh, I'm above, the, I'm so much more mature than these people and all that. Like, no, you're not and you shouldn't be. That's wrong. And it's good that you're, it's good that it's wrong because that's not who you are deep down. Deep down, she wasn't a pussy. She was not afraid to speak her mind. She wasn't afraid to, to, to take risks, to make jokes at other people's expense, at her own expense. When we were kids, I remember, I remember what that was like. And um, she still had some of that left in her, even if it may have been like 10%, she still had it. Um, when she was a kid, she was like trying super hard. So it felt like the whole thing was snuffed out. But I remember, um, we did see each other afterwards, like a year later at the CNN building, and she didn't avoid me. Um, she didn't like hide like you would think. In fact, she walked right by me when I was with my homies, and she was, she, I didn't even see her. I was walking, and she goes like, oh, hey, Afu, and just walks by, walks away without expecting a response. All dramatic. It was so cool, actually, when I think about it. It was like a movie. It's like a soap opera. <laughs> um, that was in 2017, and then she did it again in 2019, and this was at USIG. 
which uh, I'll leave the link to that video in the description as well. But I didn't even mention her in that video, but she said, what's up? And then she asked me how it was going and stuff um, and like tried to make conversation. And I was just like given like one word responses. If anything, I was a scared one. But then I was like, what the fuck am I doing? So after she left, um, she went back to her team. I went back to her and I asked her like, what changed? Like, why has she stopped being like this, like uh, the old funny Ariba, you know? Like, we had good laughs, dude. We had genuinely good laughs. She was genuinely funny. Bro, there were, there were moments growing up where we were like hanging out together. Like, I remember we were watching TV together at this person's house. And during the fucking commercials, she was saying shit like she was like roasting people in the ads and dude that was her i forgot what she said but some of the shit that she said about the ad, something that she said about one of the ads that was legit one of the funniest moments of my life she made me laugh more than some of the people like she she made me have a moment of laughter that was more intense than some of the people that i'm the closest to now who make me laugh on a daily basis it's like damn dude she really she really had something special going on you know and this was all when we were like eight years old or so, you know, seven, eight, nine years old. And I, I asked her, I'm like, so what, what changed, right? What happened? Where did that go? I didn't really get a satisfying answer from her, but it doesn't matter. Misconceptions will exist. Everybody has reasons for the things that they do. Whether they know it or not, everything is done for a reason. I don't need to know what the reason is, but I know that there is a reason. And that's good enough for me. That's my closure. But yeah, that was, um, that was the entire Mosaic experience. I had fun. Um, I actually had a lot of fun. Everyone there probably thinks I hated it because I was so like dramatic at the end. But no, I had a blast. Now, was a lot of it like a waste of time? Yeah, uh, it was very filtered and censored and very family friendly and very fake. Would I have rather spent half of that time at home uh, working on shit? Yeah, um, I'm weird and I don't enjoy fun things the way everybody else does. I get that, yeah, totally. Um, but I still had fun. I'm doing my own thing, basically. So yeah, that's pretty much everything I could think of. All I gotta say is, uh, uh, Hong Kong to Ariba for making me laugh so many times way back into a class in Ginan class and, uh, being such a fun part of, um, such a fun chapter of my childhood. Hit me up if you ever want to get back in that YouTube shit. If you ever see this or if anybody who knows you sees this and they send this to you and, uh, you ever decide to start doing YouTube again, I got you. I owe it to you. I'll, I'll help you out with that. And next is Aluma. Actually, wait, hold up. I'm I'm going to stop streaming for a bit. I got to go get some food. I need water right now. My throat's starting to dry up. But when I get back, I'm talking about Aluma. All right. Be right back.